Hey there, my incredible squad of gaming heroes. It's your friendly neighborhood Kronos, back with another mind-blowing episode of What If. Can you feel the excitement in the air? Because today, we're diving headfirst into part 5 of What If Deku Has Video Game Powers. Get ready to unleash your inner gamer as we witness the epic conclusion of this electrifying series. With pulse-pounding action, heart-racing plot twists, and jaw-dropping moments, this episode is gonna take you on the wildest pixelated ride of your life. So grab your virtual gear, level up your anticipation, and let's embark on the epic finale of this extraordinary adventure. Chapter 6, The Aftermath Dalby had escaped, which in itself had been a miracle, the symbol of peace had been on his ass, distracting him with some burn-up jackasses had been the perfect way to distract someone so high-strung as All Might. The escape of the Colosseum proper had been trickier, but he was everything but a quitter, he is a survivor, and survived this he did, despite the chokehold the police and the military had made on the Colosseum and the fact the top-ranked heroes of Japan were there pretty much destroying asses left and right, Dabi's escape was nothing but miraculous. After pretty much running until his legs gave in, Dabi made sure no one had followed him, he was able to reorient himself and correct his route now heading back home. Home being used as loosely as possible, it was a warehouse that had seen better days, but it had lights, water, and most important no one knew about it, so he could go there whenever he pleased without issue. Which he did, once he made a pit stop. 2 plus ultra combo please. After making his buy, and paying, it left less of a trail than stealing, he made his way back home. His trek back to the warehouse was uneventful, it seemed the majority of the police force had been called for the raid there, which suited him just fine, he wasn't on the mood for a fight, despite those in the underground believe of him, he isn't a brute that looks for a fight and someone to kill. He already has his own hit list, when the time is right then he will go full retard with his quirk and kill, kill and kill, maybe maim, but definitely kill. After 15 minutes of walking, he finally made it home, the fences were as usual, closed, but he knew a way around them. After finding the true entrance, he made his way to the warehouse proper. The main door was a no-go because duh it was stupid to use the front door for a property that is supposed to be abandoned. So he went to the side, with a grin he saw the secondary entrance, a hole on the side that was covered with wood and piled up cars. It had taken a while for him to make it a hidden entrance that no one would look at it two times but he made one, it was a simple affair of moving the wood, entering and placing it back. The days were getting colder, and the warehouse could get colder if he wasn't careful. The inside wasn't so different, the warehouse had been, at one point in the era before Quark and assembly line, then Quark's came and chaos followed, the aftermath was the abandonment of several properties. This one in particular was unique because it was made in brick, as a result it had resisted the test of time, much to Dobby's pleasant surprise. While most of it was empty, the offices weren't. Making to a set of stairs, Dobby made his way onward. Once up, he opened the door of the office. The doors were of wood and the other side had blankets to keep the heat inside. The windows were painted black and the walls all had blankets. The floors had rugs over rugs. This to prevent heat to leaving the room too fast and any sort of light that might indicate there is a person inside. Dobby didn't like to share, this was his home, his castle, his shit, but... Why o Dabalikyos, you're early. You can't really say no to Himiko Toga, the Yandera of Osaka. Never in a million years would any villain imagine the arsonist of Musidifu and the butcher of Osaka would be sharing a roof, let alone food and protection, but here they were. It was a rather boring story to be honest, one day Toga just appeared on his sofa after he had taken a nap, eating his food, seeing on his TV, part of him wanted to boil her alive. Then she motioned him to the sofa and a chicken leg, and the rest is history, apart from an attempt of her to suck his blood while he was asleep and the one time he burned her underwear out of spite, and the time she stabbed him in the foot, and the time he dropped a chair on her foot, and the time he switched the heater of the water while she was washing, and the time she slammed what he assumed was sentient rice that tried to eat his face and was probably two years old. 
Yeah, it was a crazy roommate relationship. Yeah, brought dinner, he said as he placed the dinner on her hands. For her part, Himiko actually looked at Dobby with some concern. He was never this early. Dobby. Her tone was serious as he unpacked the dinner. What happened? There was a raid. Dobby said as he sat on the sofa and turned the TV on. Excuse me? Toga said with a shocked look. There was a raid in the Colosseum? He nodded. That's impossible. The defenses? Didn't work. Probably sabotaged beforehand. The monsters there? Killed. I don't know what happened in the pens, but considering that All Might was there. All Might? Toga exclaimed in shock. The hell the number one hero is doing here? Wasn't he in Tokyo? Apparently not anymore, Dobby answered. Eat your burger, he added as he took a bite of his almighty burger, with three meats, five buns and enough cheese, vegetables and condiments to cause a heart attack to someone without a quirk or a heart condition. To Dobby and Toga, whose quirk's activations left them starved, this was an average dinner. So Toga began, taking a sip of her drink. The Colosseum it's a bus now. Yep. The bows were a no-go. They were sabotaged and All Might and the top heroes of the country collectively skullfucked the troop. That's about the size of it. Oh, also there was a tea doll. Don't know what happened to it. It went to the pens, and Chronostasis was there. The hell a Yakuza is doing there? Apparently looking for a little girl, the source of the quirk erasing bullets, Dobby supplied. With all that chaos, I'm pretty sure none made it out, Toga muttered, taking another chomp of her hamburger and looking at the TV. Odd, uh, this kind of thing would be plastered all over the news, she added with a frown. Now, nah, considering the military was involved, they want to keep this as tight-lipped as possible, especially with the troop involved. I give it three days before they find out via any loose-lipped dickhead, Dobby supplied. For the troop was a no-show according to the government, they'll try to downplay it and try to have one of their orders try to speak out the mess as much as possible. Toga grinded. Dobby just tisked, but kept eating in peace. He had escaped, he was safe, and he had a full belly right now. Life was good, and the troop could blow him for all he cared. He was pissed. Oh really? How can you tell? Merkel looked at Oni and Spartan and slapped the back of their heads with her hands. Shut up you numbskulls. She snapped, kicking the severed head of a death claw away. The body didn't lay far away, and she could tell by a simple glance that the head had been forcefully yanked off its neck. She didn't need a doctor to tell her that. For the other corpses littering the hall, they might need one, or ten, and a broom. Still, they lay waste on an entire contingent of boughs. The thing without a head it's new to me, Oni stated. Man, the troop only deployed golems and undertakers. I never seen half of the things that lay on the hall till this day. Spartan replied. True, maybe these were prototypes. Oni added. Does it matter? They're dead. Mirko snapped, walking past them. It should, Night Eye stated, looking at a dead liquor. Till today we had only hearsay about many of the troop's bows. The golems and undertaker units were fairly seen in North America and Europe. We had never seen something like the liquors, the nemesis, or the death claws, he added with a straight face. Death claws? That's how we are calling them. Oni pointed to the decapitated corpse of the death claw in question. Night Eye nodded. Fitting name, how the hell they came up with everything else? I mean, you just don't get up one day and say, I want to create a giant lizard with giant claws, and I'll call it Death Claw. This shit takes time. Spartan muttered. Night Eye for his part kept silent, he wanted to tell them, really wanted to tell them that every single creature they had encountered was in fact a video game monster made real. But he held back. This information was a need to know basis, at least for the moment. Right now he knew the public safety committee was preparing itself for a meeting with him and the top heroes of Japan, in at least three day time. It was standard in these kind of raids, then again there was anything but standard on this raid. The military had been involved, a necessity considering who they were dealing with, the police too, sending both regular cops and SWAT units, so they would be sending representatives for the meeting as well, 
those being the chief of police of Muzidifu and the general in charge of the units sent to aid them in the raid. Alongside a representative of the emperor, it had escalated to be perfectly honest, then again dismantling a huge recruiting center of a known terrorist organization that has been threatening pretty much everyone. The emperor and his family had not been exempt of such threats, and even dealt with some of them. The imperial palace had always held itself in high regard as impenetrable. Not even all for one had been able to penetrate its walls in his time. Then the troop pretty much dropped a bow platoon on their heads via helicopter. It was the first sighting of the golems in Japan, and it almost ended with the death of the royal family that day. It was just sheer luck that their children's practiced their quirks with their bodyguards. As a result, they were more prepared for an assault. Sighing, Naitai and company kept their walk in the halls under the Colosseum. The amount of dead boughs was staggering to say the least, also the amount of bullet casings. It was obvious that while Izuku had been the main cause of death, his mother, who at the time was found with a machine gun, was also responsible for many a death. They had to actually tiptoe on several parts, not because they were afraid one of the corpses would stand up and attack them, but because at points the floor was so chock full with body parts blood and corpses that they had to look around to place their feet and not slip on the massive puddles of blood and gore. At long last they made it to what seemed to be the main cell, the sight of two undertakers stuck to the head on a wall, more like impaled but the point stood. Is this obsidian? Oni wondered, tapping the walls of the cell. It is, Mirko stated. Never seen so much in my life in one sole spot thought, she added. One of B's henchmen has a quirk that allows him to manipulate obsidian of any quality and pretty much ultra-compressed it to create nigh-indestructible constructs. I assume this is one, a jail cell he can only manipulate open. Night I stated. Yeah, and look up. Spartan stated as they looked up and saw a broken projector. One of those projectors, it looks like a thunder hit it dead on, it's fry. He added. Look at the ground man. It looks like a thunder crashed in this particular spot, Oni added. What kind of quirk that kid has? I saw him wield a hammer and had six arms, he wondered. It's a rare quirk to be honest, Naitai mentioned, looking at the group. And how do you know about anything about the brat? Mirko wondered. Me and Lemillion went to his home for some questions. He is the source of many of the things we now know about Aldera and their inner workings. Night I began. During our talk the subject of his quirk came about, and he told us, albeit with some trepidation, his quirk has a negative dogma in our current society. He added. What, he steal quirks? Mirko asked in a joking manner. No, Oni and Spartan breathed a sigh of relief. He apparently can copy powers, permanently. He dropped the bombshell. He copies quirks permanently? Mirko all but screamed seeing how night I approached a spot of the cell, and kneeled, spotting a small, dying out seed with roots and covered in blood, it didn't take too much to figure out to who that blood belonged to. Izuka had a nasty-looking wound on his forehead. I never mentioned he could copy quirks, just powers. The fuck that means? Mirko asked, looking how night I pulled a plastic bag and some tweezers and used it to put the seed covered in blood and with roots into the bag, then seal it, the freaky part, she swears the roots moved a little. But one thing still hung on her head after they began their trek back into the surface to signal the forensic team to do the cleanup, the kid's quirk. It was obviously a copy quirk that much she could infer, there was a stigma in their society, mostly Japan to those kinds of quirks, mostly thanks to the kappa, many assumed the kappa copied quirks, but she knew better, every hero with five years of service knew better. A file it's always give to a hero who has five years under their belt, an attachment note one can sign or do not, it changes a lot. If you sign that you commit yourself to keep the secret, if you don't, then you can continue your life as a hero without a burden of a secret. Obviously she signed hers, what she read there freaked her out, a man that could steal quirks and use them, a quirk that, when used violently, at best left someone catatonic and at worst left them brain dead. A quirk belonging to a villain that subdued Japan years before her own mother was even born. When she asked why they were given this, the answer of the governmental representative chilled her to the bone. 
To be prepared, he had said. Apparently no one from their higher up to their mothers believed the man was dead, or that he hadn't left a legacy behind, a son or a daughter to carry out his will, and if so said person had his quirk. People might call Japanese paranoid people. She liked to think they are prepared for unforeseen consequences and a man that could steal quirks and might be alive or with heirs with a bone to pick was definitely such scenario. One that she dreaded. On their way to the pens as they were no, she noted a hand, or better said a forearm and a hand not laying far. The forearm looked burnt, exposing a silver bone and wires that were coated in white liquid. The hand that lay not far was smashed in. A blade under the palm was not far behind. Also it had the same white liquid pouring out of the wound. Mirko looked at both limbs, and her blood ran cold. Shit! Night I, she called the former sidekick of All Might. Might wanna interrogate that crazy bitch of B when she wakes up. I think the Midoriyas didn't just ran against Bows and a fucking Yakuza. The Thor, it was, in layman terms, a teleporter, the first of its kind, after studying quirk users with teleportation quirks and dissecting them, they had been able to create a compact teleported that could be carried anywhere and used at any time. But it had its kinks to work with in first place. Like most teleportations, it needed a destination, and the Thor needed a relay to be used effectively. Two messy accidents had taught them that. The second problem had not been the energy requirements, but rather the user in question, as they learned right now. Jesus! Clam its leg, where its leg? It's somewhere in the relay, it just fell off. Start emergency protocols. Prepare an emergency shutdown and milk transfusion. Forget that. Start core shutdown and PB transplant. The body it's a lost. Omega, a man clad in black, all black, black shirt, black cargo pants, black boots, black leather gloves, and a blank mask with no eye holes in them and with a cloth covering the head and hair, just looked as the recovery team carried M98, or what was left of it, away. All while M98 shuddered as the damage done by Izuka Midoriya was amplified by the Thor transportation. This was one of the greatest flaws of the Thor. If you want to be teleported, be prepared to suffer, a lot. Reason why it was only issued to the dolls, they were about the only thing that could survive it and survive it was being used very loosely here. They could move their cores and positronic brains, or PBs for short. The bodies could be recycled for something else. Both those two components were the most delicate and important parts of a Terminator doll. The rest was expendable. Yet, never before the Thor had delivered them such a damaged doll. One thing was the readings and telemetry. Other was his eyes. Omega stared as M98 was wheeled away eyes rolled back and leaking white blood, milk as it was called by the technicians due to its coloration and actual flavor being very close to real milk. The last person who drank a whole glass on a dare had his esophagus burned by the concentration of chemicals in it. It might taste like milk, but it behaves more like battery acid. I never imagined I would see M98 like this. The handler of M98, just like everyone in the room, unlike him was clad in a white hazmat suit that clung to his chest, loose on the arms and legs, covering most of the head, and a gas mask covering his face. Everyone in the troop inner workings wore clothes like this, Omega, being of a higher status wore black, as required, while H8, or Handler 8, and the rest of scientists and technicians wore this instead. No one could know the identity of other personnel, names were forgotten, and while sex did occur among their ranks, it was more informal than anything else, venting, keeping their identities hidden at any time was paramount, although some did show their faces from time to time, but no one knew the names of the others, just their code names. Indeed, Omega whispered, looking at H8 straight at the lenses. Any idea what those strange energy readings were? H8 simply motioned his superior to his workspace, a desk filled with five monitors and three CPU towers two keyboards and a mouse that had seen better days. Not a clue, they are in the exotic category. And by exotic I mean the guys back in R&D are about to crack their skulls open trying to figure it out. Their supercomputer is running blanks, H8 stated. There hasn't been too much time since they were recorded. 
I presume their equipment will be able to catalog it in a day's time. Omega saw HH shake his head. No, when I meant running blanks, what I wanted to say was that one single reading of the over 30 exotic readings we got crashed their computer. Omega blinked behind his mask. It's a supercomputer, a supercomputer that leaves the ones in Ireland looking like solar calculators. I know, boss, but those readings are off the charts. They violate every single law we can think of. Before it crashed, the computer cataloged it as emission white. You know what that means. Omega did. Emission white of energies. Energies that should not exist, yet they did, and as a result violated natural laws. At least the natural laws established by the troop. Island scientists were stupid in his opinion and was shared among the troop scientists, thinking that studying quirks would open doors to new opportunities for human development. They were blind, quirks were a poison, and they were all living a dream. The troop would wake them up of that dream and drag them to a new era, kicking and screaming if needed. Never mind that, have M98 memories copied, and have I-44, I-45 and I-46 study them, and once done, deploy them against the Zook Midoriya. H8 nodded, already relaying the orders on his workplace. I will not suffer any kind of delays in our plans, have him killed, have his mother killed and have the child with them killed, then bring the corpses. If nothing else, their corpses will help usher our goals. With that said, Omega walked away. H8 nodded at his boss commands, not even questioning them. The troop had already killed many people, children included. What was one more? Two days later, Musidifa's general hospital. Par casual forces, in Ares' opinion, were pretty. Not that she had much to compare them to. Most of her life had been a blend of white, gray, and red and she could associate each color with a mood, white for loneliness, gray for dread, red for pain. Now there were other colors, blue, purple, yellow, green, sounds too, the staccato of fire, the screeches, the sudden crackle of lighting and the strange sound the void made, or the very sound of fire so hot it should burn her to cinders yet felt so warm that it chased the bad memories that haunted her. Green was now a color she associated with protection and warmth, also a strange feeling of doing something never before she would have dared to do what she did to that man also she didn't realize her horn was that sharp might had used it before if she had but the point stood being around them made her feel alive she didn't feel like a cursed object the way they smiled at her how their hands felt so warm and soft the care she didn't realize but she craved that the warmth the sense of belonging to have someone actually care for you and not being treated like trash. Sounds that at one point made her afraid made her comfortable, the strange, almost ancient words he spoke it made her believe that with a single word the darkness could be chased away. For once in her life, Ari felt hope. Also she got a taste of it. It tasted to apples, sweet, juicy and refreshing. She didn't want to let this go. Izuku, what the doctor told you about starting fires while on bed, Inko supplied, all while cutting more apple slices for Eri, who had her attention divided between greedily looking at the slices and looking at the miniature sun that floated between Izuku's cupped hands. Mom, it's okay, I need to practice. Besides, this is more of for how long I can hold into it, not making it bigger, Izuku said from his place on the hospital bed and clad in hospital scrubs. You're making a miniature sun. Inko stated. A really warm miniature sun. She added as an afterthought. Making another apple slice for Eri to eat. The girl was ravenous when it came to apples. It is a sun mom. Of course it's warm. Izuku said without looking up. Slowly closing his hands over the miniature sun and slowly extinguish it. I like the warm. Eri said. Munching on a slice and enjoying its taste. Izuku and Inko just shared a small glance as the little girl ate the apple slice with gusto. After the incident in the Colosseum, the trio had been taken to the Musidifo Hospital, first because it was customary for kidnapped people to be taken into a safe location for healing and rest, second because they had been in a combat scenario as well, at the time they hadn't realized, but they had accumulated wounds on their escape. It wasn't until everything was said and done that they had realized of it. Izuku had collapsed the moment they had reached an ambulance. 
His right leg was swollen due to the pressure he had put into it. He had small black spots on his skin that to the paramedics that had treated him were consistent with bullet impacts. He assumed that dragon aspect and the constant use of the light had made his skin somewhat bulletproof, but the worse he was an exhaustion symptom acute to the overusage of a quirk. After all for all their power, a quirk was a physical ability. Like a muscle it can be strained, even tore if overused. Add that to a strange concoction of drugs that they found in his system later, the wound on his forehead, and a severe case of dehydration, Izuku was put on a bed immediately, the cast on his leg replaced, put on a sling, also put on serum. Lots of it while he recovered and his body now strange body functions burned the strange drug cocktail he was sure belonged to the seed that had found home on his forehead and his mom had pulled off. Inko had wounds as well, grazing shots around her body, mostly her legs and arms. It was a surprise that she or Izuka didn't notice until a paramedic pointed them out. Then Izuka freaked out, and she freaked out, and Eri freaked out, but seeing that most wounds she had were in fact superficial, glancing wounds. Bullets coming too close to hit her, but actually spitting open skin, like a knife, there was little to do but to disinfect, clean and stick. Eri on the other hand, now that was a scary discovery. She wasn't hurt per se, she presented early signs of dehydration and starvation, at least two days at most, and that was the peak of the iceberg when it came to Aries' wounds. Once a doctor, with Inko's help, removed her bandages on her arms and legs, the horror truly began. Her arms, at least forearms, had a myriad of aging scars that were both superficial and thin to deep and wide, almost leaving crevices over her skin. However, there was a recent wound in her arm, showing signs that it had been peeled off, showing the flesh underneath. Her legs, while not showing the same amount of scars, did have wounds, more precisely on her saws, they were old also, but one could infer that when done, they had hurt her and limited her movement a lot, to make matters worse, her right calf was also missing a small chunk of skin, it would have been chalked as falling off and scrapping her leg. If it wasn't for the surgical-like precision both wounds had, squared shaped, the edge of the skin around it showing signs of burning, likely a laser, which somehow prevented the wound from bleeding too much. Eri showed, shame of those wounds she looked at them and seemed to zone out, and pale, likely remembering the person who did them in the first place, suffice to say that the doctor in attendance had been angry enough for both Inko and Izuku, being a parent himself with a child of Eri's age. Then Eri dropped the bombshell, the lack of skin came also with molestation. The room they were now was in fact the second room, the first room they had been was now, uninhabitable thanks to Izuka suddenly bursting into flames so hot that they melted the ceramic of the floor and fused it with the bed he was in. Also Eri said they had took blood and tears of her, officially the troop was in Izuka's I'm going to cave their skulls and list, a very surprisingly short list. So far they were the only names in it. After that they remained in the hospital, under police protection and custody. Despite everything that had happened, Izuku, Inko and Eri were key witnesses of the events that transpired two nights ago, and while most of the interrogation had been done after they arrived to the hospital, there was no guarantee that the police would come asking for more, especially asking for Eri's cooperation. The Yakuza who they encountered knew Eri on a personal basis and Eri was afraid enough of him to know who he was, and who he worked for. To be able to dismantle one of the last Yakuza organizations in Japan had been a huge goal for the police and heroes in general. To be able to get rid of the shadow of the organization and name itself brought was something many in the law enforcement department wished. One less problem to deal with. Knock. 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 Inko tensed, gripping the knife in her hand a little tighter than usual. Come in, she called, letting a small breath out as she saw the form of the detective Naomesa Tsukachi enter the room. Midoriya san, Midoriya kuen, Eri chan, afternoon, Naomesa called, taking his hat off and letting someone else enter. Izuka's breath hitched. Oh my god, it's the youthful heroine, recovery girl. He geeked out, spotting the aged form of the legendary medic and heroine. Despite her age and obvious lack of height, she carried herself with an aura of pride, pride for her work that is. 
Well, good to finally meet the child that has All Might all flustered and worried about. Recovery Girl said, entering the room, which made Izuka flustered even more, and began to mutter, a lot. For a minute straight. Eventually it would be Eri who would silence him, with a slice of apple shoved to his flapping mouth. Thank you, child. Although it was fascinating to see him talk without breathing at such speed, Recovery Girl said, walking to the bed and taking the medical notes nearby and started to read them. Well, that could have gone better. On to business then. I know you three want to leave as soon as possible. Nao Mesa began. First order of business, thanks to your efforts, you spared us a very difficult fight in securing the Colosseum. On behalf of the police force we thank you. He said with a small bow to the trio. Inko and Izuka flustered, waving their arms around, saying it was nothing at the same time. It was kinda cute to see from who Izuka got his sensibilities. With that out of the way, we got to the second part of this meeting, due to the fact you three can identify the main actors that orchestrated your kidnapping, it is sensible to put you three in witness protection program, and no we are not changing your names. We will have a police and hero detail escorting you whenever you go until the day of the trial occurs. Nao Mesa began. Trial? There's going to be a trial? Izuka wondered out loud. Yes, Midoriya-kun, ignoring the fact they all knew this was a troop operation. Every single soul in the Colosseum was engaging in some very illegal deals, drugs deals, weapon trafficking, assassinations believe it or not. Hell we have reasons to believe some of the older individuals captured in the Colosseum were in fact able to influence the mayor elections two years ago, and to make matters worse, half of them belonged to Alder Ahai students and teachers alike. Izuka actually was without words. Even the teachers? Naomesa nodded. The one you used to learn from was exempt of any kind of culpability, aside negligence. Oddly enough there was no one from your class in the Colosseum, which leads us to believe your class in particular was some sort of control specimen or something, with the ties the troop had in the Colosseum and the knowledge we have so far. We can assume the teachers capture knew about the troop, and your entire class was a social experiment of some sort, but right now that's only speculations. Izuka looked rather pale at that revelation. Are you trying to say that my son's suffering so far has been an experiment? Inko hissed at Naomesa. We can't really tell unless we start interrogations proper. The amount of captures that night alone broke the current record the station had on captures on raids by a large margin. The fact most of them are minors makes it worse. Every single one of them will have a lawyer or their legal guardian present during those interrogations. We cannot allow us to fail now, especially with what we got during the raid. Nao Mesa continued as he walked around the room, picked a chair and sat down. Recovery Girl just kept reading the medical file of Izuku. Right now we have officers working overtime in the interrogations, gathering evidence and believe it or not video evidence. The Colosseum had serves on it, tied to the security cameras that were located in the entrances and the pens. Izuka tensed up. By the way, congratulations, you're the first civilian. If not the first quirk user period to make a T-Doll retreat with severe damage and expose a means of escape we didn't knew about them. Nao Mesa praised. As I heard it, the scientists of Ireland want to meet you and study your quirk in detail. Recovery Girl said with a smile. Wait, I, island, how, why, how? Izuka whispered, and Recovery Girl had to raise an eyebrow. His whispers were loud enough to be confused as normal voice tone. I'll explain that later, continued Detective. Recovery Girl said, Nao Mason nodded, not wanting to be on the bad side of the elderly nurse that could bend all might to a blubbering mess with a glance. Very well, despite your accomplishment, and raking the highest kill count, there is more. A T-Doll has not been in Japan for the past five years. The last confirmed sighting was by Endeavor, and usually their sighting means that they are carrying sensitive troop operations. The fact it engaged you personally tells us that you were the sensitive operation the doll was supposed to take care of. That doesn't fill me with confidence, Izuka muttered. Can relate, having a bullseye painted on your back can be intimidating, but I heard you want to be a hero, that comes with the territory. Nao Mesa encouraged. Just don't let this get over your head. Last thing we need it's another power-hungry would-be villain. 
Izuka shook his head vigorously, making Naomesa smile. The drivers we found on their servers will allow us to pin a lot of those kids with charges that begin with assault and end with first-degree homicide and homicide with quirk. Some of them will be as old as Recovery Girl is now when they get out. So said woman was about to slam her cane on the shin of the detective, but bit the urge to do so. He was right after all. A complete waste of potential in her honest opinion. And our testimony will sink them further good, Inko stated, honestly happy that this would have a fitting ending. Yeah, but we got an issue. Nao Mesa began, reaching for his coat and pulling some pictures, then placing them on the bed, Inko reached for them, and actually gasped in shock. Mom? Izuka asked. Inko wordlessly handed the pictures to her son, and he gasped as well. The department complex where they lived was nothing more than rubble. Every single apartment, just gone. What happened? Izuka asked. It happened a day ago. Witnesses claim a man with a green furred coat. Eri tensed. And a, and I quote, toucan-like mask covering his mouth. Eri began to shake. Came around, touched a wall of the building, and this is the result. Nao Mesa stated. No, Eri whispered. He's gonna find Mekin fine when fine. Eri's rant ended when Izuka hugged her, hard. Eri calm down, take deep breaths, with me, Su Amark Mora. Izuka began. Su dash. Su Amark Mora. Su Amark Mora. Again, Su Amark Mora. Su Amark Mora. Good, Su Amark Mora, breath and focus. Izuka said, still holding Eri who began to take deep breaths and slowly stop her panic attack, or the beginning of one. Well, that about confirms it. Nao Mesa began seeing Izuka comfort Eri. No one aside the heroes and very selected officers knew about where you guys lived or your names, just your faces, which lead us to believe we have a mole. There was no way this guy knew about you guys, let alone where you lived. Nao Mesa began. And before you panic, the hospital is being currently patrolled by several heroes. If this guy tries anything, we'll be ready. Eri actually shook her head. You won't. She began, taking deep breaths. Overhaul, use me to make something. Eri continued. So his name's Overhaul, Nao Mesa muttered. About two years ago, a new drug began flowing in the underworld. A drug that could cancel quirks and be fired from a gun. Its potency began to increase. From minutes to the current standard two hours, Nao Mesa said, glancing at Eri's arms, and the myriad of scars dotted in them. A girl as young as her shouldn't had so many scars, if none at all. He did this to you, right? Eri slowly nodded. How? he asked. He touches you, then there is pain, then darkness, then pain again, and again and again, she whispered, glancing at her arms. Sometimes I would get away. He didn't like that. So he broke me apart and put me together as painful as possible. She added with a choked sob, turning to Izuku and burying her face on his chest, crying. Naomesa looked at the sobbing child, then at Izuku, who looked less than happy about what was told. He seemed really considering going after overhaul for what he did to Eri. And after seeing what he did to those bows, Naomesa thought, I shudder to think how this battle will end. With a sigh, the detective patted Eri's head. Eri, listen to me very carefully. Nao Mesa began. I know you won't like this, to bring more painful memories. He added, taking a deep breath. But we need to know more about him. Where's his base? Who are his allies? How developed the bullets are? We need that info, so others don't suffer like you. Eri was now sobbing, but not as loud as before. Detective, she already suffered enough, Inko interfered. Wouldn't be better if you let her rest? She asked. Nao Mesa shook his head. Impossible. What Overhaul did to your home was clearly a message, and while we restricted the information of your location, it is just a matter of time before he figures out, so we have a plan. Nao Mesa began. But first, Eri, can I believe in you? Who believes in me? That was so bad. Eri said with a snort, also snorting some mucus from her nose, then cleaning it up with her scrubs. But yes, she stated, looking at Izuku and Inko for support. 
We'll be here all the way, Inko said with a kind smile. We won't go anywhere. You're stuck with us. Eri smiled at that statement. Okay, that's good, because Eri here is pretty much a ghost, Naomesa added. No files, no birth certificate, not even a Facebook picture with her on it. This overhaul went to great lengths to erase her of the map. Thankfully, we can use this to our advantage, the detective stated. How? Izuka asked. Right now, little Eri is registered, but under Inko Midoriya's legal custody, those files are sealed now due to the incognito clause most heroes can apply their families and associates to, Naomesa said. But I don't have a hero relative, Inko summarized. No, but you work on a hero agency. Magma Dragoon and Frost vouched for your family. As of right now, only the top ten can access those files, only government officials with the right clearance can access them. If someone tries to get them, we'll know, and they will wish it was Mirko who got them, trust me. Naomesa stated seriously. Albeit we might have a clue who might have leaked your home location, he added as an afterthought. But never mind that, he said, reaching for his coat again, and pulling what seemed to recorded from its inner pockets, then placing it in front of Eri and Izuku. Now Eri-chan, like Midoriyakuen said, breath and focus, when you're ready, just nod, and we'll start. Eri looked at Naomesa, then at Izuku, then at Inko, took a deep breath, and nodded. Naomesa clicked the recorder on. Eri, I want you to tell me, who is Overhaul? Naomesa asked. His name is Kai Chisaki. He hates it. He hates heroes. He hates me. Eri began. He is a monster who hates everyone. Two hours later. Nao Mesa clicked the recorder off, swallowing bile and the urge to pull his gun and hunt overhaul himself and empty his gun on his skull. As a cop, and more so as a detective he had seen some messed up shit, heard it all, seen it all. But Eri's story was the kind of story you only hear once in your lifetime. A story of struggle, pain and above all how low a man can sink for his goals, even more so with powers to help him in his descent. Kai Chisaki had placed himself, with his actions, into Naomesa's top list of most depraved men ever. What he did to Eri was just, inhuman. From what they could infer during her confession Overhaul's quirk seemed to be a touch-based quirk. Unlike most quirks, his simply required a single touch with his finger, any finger, and then he could reassemble and disassemble at his beck and call. It was a horrifying quirk, one recovery girl called a waste because if he could do that, and Eri was living proof, he could do the same to a person and heal them of any illness because he did this to a molecular level. Izuku believed it too, but such quirk, powerful as it is, must have a weakness as crippling as it is powerful. Eri revealed them that weakness. She had seen him do the same to his own underlings, and every time he would flinch at the sight of blood, hell it seemed he hated anything that was grime, dirt or anything that remotely looks like trash. He was germophobic and viewed quirks as any other disease in the world. And any quirk user as a carrier that had to be cured what this cure entailed was anyone's guess. But Naosama assumed it involved the bullets he had made with Ares' blood. Now that was the kicker. Her quirk seemed to have permeated her blood cells as well. But obviously other factors waited on the fact her blood was the key component for the QB. Maybe Overhaul had done something to her during one of their sessions and had modified her to suit his needs, perhaps even making her quirk stronger. Thus making it sure it bled to her blood cells and thus gain more powerful material for the bullets. But that was all speculation. During the confession Eri began to talk more and more, revealing things that would help them against the Yakuza, for once the names or rather code names of Overhaul's most trusted underlings and trusted was being used loosely. If he viewed you as dead weight, you were as good as dead. Once she began speaking, there was no stopping her. She told them about the location of their compound, a route she had memorized many times before during her escapes, a secret exit in case of a raid she used as well to escape. She could truly not tell them how many Yakuza were in the compound, but she said many but overhauls minions. The Eight Precepts of Death, such an edgy name, were the strongest, right behind Overhaul himself. She told them about the location of the bullets, 
hidden deep within the compound, again, she couldn't count, but she told them they had many alongside the modified guns. They already had a confiscated version of one, all thanks to Chronostasis, who looked like if All Might had used him as a punching bag. She even threw something he didn't expect, two bank accounts she had learned them. After all those around her didn't expect much of her, only to be scared and submissive, not memorizing numbers and complex letter combinations, that cockiness would cost them dearly. Of course she spoke slowly, she was barely five, but the information supplied would be tremendous. Thank you, Eri Chan, this information will save lives. Nao Mesa was already running simulations on his head, who to delegate for the delicate task of obtaining and fact-checking the information supplied by Eri. Honestly he was thinking on giving it to Naitai, he was already knee-deep in the Yakuza case. It would only be fitting to do so. He had another whale to catch. Okay, now for the third part of my reason here, Nao Mesa stated, looking at Inko and Izuku. As you know, Overhaul tore your home apart, as a message. Izuku scoffed. Bring Eri or there will be unintended consequences. Izuku snapped bitterly. The only consequences will be what will happen when I rip his arms off. Izuku no, Inko admonished him. His quirk is literally on his hands, either knock him off or cripple him. No half measures, no compromises. Izuku snapped softly, and Nao Mesa had the distinct impressions that he might have tipped them for a strategy against overhaul. Yes, on his message not on you ripping him limb to limb, Nao Mesa amended. While he is a concern, we have others as well. First, the troop of course, what you did in the Colosseum will have repercussions. We have some breathing room, but this will not go unanswered. Then we have pretty much every person on that raid we captured. Or to be more precise, their parents. I swear if they hired a lawyer to defend those little brats, Inko swore. They did that. But the thing is that everything done by their children is videotaped. They even were recording on their cell phones, including when All Might busted in. That's evidence they can't refute. But they'll try to ensure you don't testify against them. It could prove the difference between a full sentence or half of it. If nothing at all. Nao Mesa. Then there's B and Aldera proper, their lawyer well. You can imagine what they're trying to discredit you. Nao Mesa stated. And with me breaking her legs. Izuka left the sentence hang. Exactly, but it can be filled under self-defense, be attacked first, with all the intention of killing, what you did was legitimate, despite what that lawyer might try, but again we must move you, for the safety of you three, one has the key for a very dangerous drug in her system, the other became a sworn enemy of a terrorist organization, and the three of you are hunted by the Yakuza, there is one logical conclusion to reach here, we must move you away, of Japan if needed. That shook Inko and Izuku to the core. Excuse me? Move us of Japan if needed? But where? Who would welcome us? She wondered. I have just the guy who arranged it. Come on in. Recovery girl shouted. You will all be fine. Why? Oh my god. Izuku ultra nerd. The door bursted open, and in came All Might in the flesh, in a horrible mustard-colored two-piece suit, at least to Inko. To Izuka he looked glorious. Because I am here. Visiting you like a normal person. No you're not. Recovery girl snapped. Hitting All Might in the calves with her cane. Making him yelp as he jumped on one foot. And stop doing that you loud mouth gorilla. They are trying to remain incognito. I am so sorry O-U-C-H. Stop it. Inko actually blinked. Not used to seeing this face of the mighty All Might, he looked so normal now instead of the unstoppable juggernaut that defeated evil with a smile and a concussion at a time. Recovery girl, Nao Mesa started. Stop it, we are strapped on time as it is, he added, making the nurse to relent. All Might has offered a solution that can benefit us all from the get-go, All Might. The symbol of peace nodded. First and foremost, why you broke her knee? All Might directed the question to Izuku. She broke my leg in 14 parts. But you had a flaming hammer. I failed to see what you failed to see. All Might just sighed at this. At one point he is justified. He was getting even. 
He knew the feeling. He did caved all for one skull still. Never mind that. After your display, I asked my old sidekick Night Eye regarding you young one. What he told me it's nothing short of amazing and perturbing. All Might began. Don't get me wrong. I don't expect you to become a villain or something. You did put the protection of your mother and the little one above all else, even yours. Great, you two are self-sacrificing blockheads, Recovery Girl said with a pout. Must I remind you the time you went for a week without sleeping to heal an entire school? Recovery Girl remained silent at that. Hmm, as I was saying, your quirk is powerful, but it is rare, and more so what you draw from, and I cannot help that you are going to end up attracting the wrong sort of attention, troop kind of attention notwithstanding, so I came with a solution that will benefit us all. Inko and Izuka leaned in. How you feel about living with pro heroes? Ehia! Their combined scream made the hospital vibrate. Anything? Overhaul asked, looking at Warden straight in the eyes. No, sir. The area still remains patrolled and cordoned by heroes and the police, and there are still rescue efforts for those trapped in the rubble but no one has seen them ever since the raid on the Colosseum. Warden replied, only to receive a growl as answer from Overhaul. Sir, don't get angry with me. What you did was needless to do. He stated firmly, usually people who criticized Overhaul tended to explode in a shower of gore, but at this point it had to be said. Now the heroes must have them on protective custody, and hidden, and our man can't find them. Because you decided to send a message we can't back up. Warden added. We are Yakuza, Warden. Overhaul snapped. Before this kind of things would not be tolerated. He added. Exactly before, this is not the past. We don't have the manpower or the political status to fall back to when things like this happened. Warden argued. And sure as hell we didn't have actual heroes beating us back then. You, as a leader, have to admit you messed up big time. Their overhaul narrowed his eyes, glancing at Warden from the corner of his eyes. And why I should do that? Overhaul began. Those two stole from us. Not only that, thanks to them, Chronostasis is in Tartarus right now. The production of the bullets cannot continue without Eri. That cursed thing decided to rebel again. So I did what I did every time Eri did that. I taught a lesson on why I shouldn't be crossed. What's so different now that I should actually admit I messed up? Warden shook his head. Because Eri never made it to police custody. Because Eri never got close enough to a hero to have her case looked up in greater detail. Because those she sought refuge weren't, one a trained soldier and an apparent quirk juggernaut. Because never one of your men was captured. Because never before All Might or any other hero had stuck their nose in our business. Warden snapped. But thanks to your flexing we got a problem. We lost sight of the Midorias. We lost sight of Eri, thanks to the info you got from our inside man you tore their home. Now he's alienated from the case because he is suspect. And the heroes are swarming every suspect business tied to us. Not just Troop, us too. Warden snapped angrily. So excuse me when I say, yes you just fucked us big time with your impatient nature. He added with a snarl. All that remained then was silence as Overhaul clenched his fists together. He so wanted to blast this fool for critiquing him, but never before anyone had done this with the truth backing them up. He was right, he should had waited, let them return home, then he could had struck, he could had gone micro, go for them, not the apartment building, now the heroes were looking for them, it wasn't stated, but it was implied, but old habits die hard, and he had learned that spreading fear so Eri could see it would bring her back to him. He should correct himself. Eri wasn't a she, it was a thing, one with a singular purpose, and it was angering that Eri didn't buckle this time. He blamed it on the Midorias, he didn't knew much of them only their names and faces, two idiots in his opinion, but one of them could easily disembowel him with a knife if given the chance. After all she trained with a legend in the military world, then there was her son, no one knew what his quirk was. But apparently it was powerful enough to enable his survival against a small army of bows, an army the troop had used to keep them locked, and it didn't help one bit. Now Overhaul was worried, what if this had all been planned? Ares' escape had been well-timed, too well-timed, 
Not only she was now gone, but in the hands of heroes and two individuals that might not look like it, but were rather dangerous, one with a military background, the other with an apparent overpowered quirk. Placing Aerie with them as protection, then making sure they were not found was genius, and in the event they were found, there was no guarantee that whoever did it would come back to tell the tale. Shaking those thoughts aside, Overhaul focused on what he had available at the moment. Sigh, never mind, we have other matters to attend. Eri will come back to us. It is just a matter of time. In the meantime, I want you to find a way to ensure our operations don't suffer from this setback. Without chronostasis around, they will suffer. I want you to ensure the damage is mitigated. Warden nodded. And what about Chrono? Warden asked, already knowing the answer. What about him? Recovery Girl kept her gaze on the files, not even glancing at the two gaping Midoriyas in the room, her eyes scanning the papers that detailed the extent of Izuka's injuries, both physical and the extent of his quirk being stressed out by overusage. He should be dead. The thought kept repeating, over and over. He should be dead. And it was not because of the creatures he fought, but because of the results she was seeing right now. The strange cocktail of drugs in his system alone should have sent him into a coma at best, and into a neurogenic shock at worst due to how that seed was implanted and how it was removed. She had half a mind to snap at Inko Midoriya, but considering she is a mother, a mother trapped with her son that was, apparently fighting within his own mind against an apparition created by that seed, fired by a man with a quirk that caused horrible hallucinations that lead to death. She could be forgiven for ripping that thing like if it was a scab. The fact he survived that alone was miraculous. Then he had to actually stand up, quite literally overload himself with power and go and rampage through an army of abominations of nature in a state that she could only claim as delirious thanks to the drugs running in his system. That much activity should have caused a heart attack, yet he was fine by the time everything was said and done, he was dead tired by the time he was loaded into an ambulance with his mother and the little girl, but he was fine, conscious, for the most part, and two days later, the very picture of health, despite his leg being still on a cast and broken. She could easily chalk it up to dumb luck, Lord knows Yagi is running on that shit every damn day he goes heroing with that damn hole in his side and a timer that grows ever shorter. But the results in front of her told her otherwise. His glands were producing more adrenaline than any human would ever use, and it was hyper-concentrated. It was more than any other human would ever need or use, and he produced a huge amount, as a standard. His vocal cords were, well, present Mike was the only person alive with vocal cords as sturdy as this kid, but also it was on a different level, they vibrated at a different level, causing an inflection of sounds that, well, for the lack of better words vibrated the room. It wasn't that he was loud because of his quirk. But because it was a necessity of it, she could tell, normal vocal cords would cease to be if they tried to match this kid's own tone of voice. Then there were the next two, and she was right now considering a drink, a whole bottle of vodka to be honest. The tattoos emitted energy. They didn't just glowed because of fancy bioluminescence, the glow was indicative of energy. Of what kind she didn't knew, only that it was related to the extra arms he seemed to summon out of freaking nowhere, and hit with the equivalent strength of either a speeding truck. A feather blown by the wind or a meteor just entering the atmosphere, it depended on the kid, and worse of all, the energy seemed malleable, and had bonded with the other energy in the kid. The last one just, the less said the better, it broke every law she knew about energy in general, whatever it was. It could shift parameters, it could be as dangerous as a nuclear explosion or as harmless as a candle behind glass, and he seemed to have an understanding of it, and a semblance of control. By God one of the nurses told her that they caught him manipulating a miniature sun, warm and all. What kind of crazy quirk this kid has? Old memories kept reminding her that it was too similar to all for one, but at the same time so different, Jaggi was here because of that because Night Eye had told them that his quirk was an analog of all for one, and also he had told them that in his honest opinion, was not all for one at the same time, a different beast altogether. He didn't went into details, only that if they wanted to know they had to ask him, 
as even he had a hard time believing what it could do, that and the fact he didn't use his quirk on the boy, which was odd, maybe that's why they could deploy this fast without issues despite the initial kidnapping, no forewarning of the future. Just plain old skill, girth and hope guiding them. Okay you two stop it. Recovery girl snapped, honestly a little miffed by Yagi's utter lack of tact, a trait that most heroes seem to have nowadays. The two Midoriyas stopped gaping like fishes, looking at the elderly nurse, then at All Might, then slowly, oh so slowly calming down. Recovery girl noted how the boy was emitting some sort of electric current along his body, with the girl close to him. The fact she wasn't affected by it meant that he could tell who was friend from foe and his energy would act the same, friends would not be affected, foes on the other hand. As you know, Naomesa began. Your actions had not gone unnoticed. By both heroes and villains, the destruction of your home was just such indicative of the attention dragged to you both. I wouldn't find it odd that the troop would start sending bows to fight Izuku. What better way to test their durability but to pit them against someone that ran over a small army of those same creatures? Naomesa stated. So we created this plan. We moved you three to a compound outside the city. A team of heroes has agreed to shelter you in and help train young Midoriya's quirk, and prepared him in the event the troop attacks once more, which is guaranteed, they don't, take interference so well, All Might said. I should know. They send bows regularly just to damage my clothes, knowing that nothing they have can hope to stop me, let alone kill me. I mean I did punch a tea doll apart. All Might admitted, much to the shock of Inko. For Izuku it was just another thing he knew about the symbol of peace. You on the other hand, are another matter, despite the fact you tore a whole bow army with your mother, this makes you more of a target and a collateral insider, and even if you defend yourself and with evidence backing you up, it can turn ugly quickly, just as the troop wants it. To isolate you from authorities that can help you and your family, then there is the Yakuza. I will admit this is a first to them they are not known for being this open when it comes to messages, which makes me concerned, if this, overhaul went to this length, I shudder to think what he will do next. All Might admitted. The first thing we must do is train you, so at the very least you can defend yourself more efficiently, minimize the amount of energy expended and ensure efficient takedowns. I get the feeling you're training me more for hero work. All Might rose an eyebrow at Izuku, all while Inko rolled her eyes. Son, every kid wants to be a hero. You're about to jump to the ceiling on the concept of you training already. Inko clarified. Besides, isn't what you wanted? Inko teased slash asked. I do, but I actually expected training to happen while in UA, not before. Well, extreme actions, extreme reactions, Naomesa stated. This would also pacify the committee. They think you're a villain in progress. Izuku actually growled, I know. The detective rose his hands. I don't like it either, but to be fair to them, they are so overworked and understaffed that they just give glimpses to files and only take good. Hard looks to others when things like the Colosseum raid occurred, then your file happened to their hands. And no it's not about the alleged rape accusation when you were in Aldera, it was more off, you snapping bees kneecaps with a flaming hammer. Naomesa admitted, but if you happened to do this training, it would pacify them. Showing them you're not a villain in progress, and that breaking B's knees was an isolated event caused by stress. Naomesa concluded. Izuka remained silent, slowly stroking Ari's hair, and looking at the number one hero, he was geeking, and the detective. How long? Izuka asked. How long this will last? Hiding? Izuka wondered, looking at his mom. Not sure. The idea here is to make sure you three can present yourselves for the trial in two months, to add your testimonies to the already growing pile of evidence. This will put the nail in the coffin of many of those involved in the Colosseum raid. This is hugely important. We have been profiling most of the captured. The majority are in gangs with criminal records that would land an adult into jail in a snap. Naomesa stated, The lawyers of those kids will fight tooth and nail to get them free and they know about their records, and they don't care because they are already paid, half of those lawyers are also in Yakuza pocket. And in the case of the Aldera lawyer you warned me about, both Yakuza and Troop pocket. Naomesa stated, 
As you can imagine, they will try anything to stop you three from testifying. They already seem to try on the legal front, Naomesa added. There are legal attempts to have you three dismissed for mental illness as you can figure out. Without proof of this, the judge has dismissed these claims, Naomesa concluded. But not for them, Inko said, looking at her son, who looked back at her, all while holding Eri. Izuku took a deep breath, what was going to ask from All Might, and the detective was going to be hard. Did something was recovered from our home? Books? Computer files? Anything? The Greenie asked. Actually, yes, Naomesa answered with some mirth. Some books called Hero Notes, for the future volumes 1 to 12, rather compelling readings I am told, Vlad King was rather interested in the notes detailing his quirk and Cementos was flattered by the accuracy of his. Izuka now regretted asking about his books. He wanted to be consumed by the darkness now. Oh, okay, Izuka whispered. Give them to Sir Nighteye for safekeeping, there is another book. Simply labeled my quirk, it has all of my notes regarding my quirk so far, I need it. Hmm, haven't found that one yet. Our efforts have been focused on rescue, but I can spare a guy to find them. Naomesa promised. My computer and my console, I know my computer must be damaged. It was, Naomesa confirmed. But not the hard drive, the case model was the kind advertised by best genus of all people. A bomb can go off and nothing would happen to the drive. I need the drive, the console too. That thing could have an elephant stomp on it, and nothing would happen to it. My quirk depends on those two things, Izuka clarified. Naomesa and All Might share a look, then nodded. I'll see what I can do, anything else? He asked. Izuka took a deep breath. The troop wants to go nuts. Okay, let's get nuts. The Yakuza wants to get dangerous. Okay, let's get dangerous. I need a controller, Izuka finally answered. What for? All Might asked. You wanted to know about my quirk. Izuka began, his hand slowly arching with arc energy. Okay, here's how it works. And Izuka told them. Two days later, Musita for Police Department. Akio Mineta was not the first option for Chief of Police of the Musita for Police Department, despite being a devoted officer. However, the former chief had chosen him for several reasons. One of them was his lack of tolerance for corruption. Akio hated corruption within the force, and alongside the former chief of the department, had started a campaign against the corrupted officers within the station that had been 10 years ago. Then the docks incident occurred, and the former chief had to resign in shame, mostly because the mayor was a huge dick. That and the mayor's son, Durara Honda, his predecessor had warned him about the brat, not even hair in his face, and the brat actually believed he would come and run shit around the station. In ten years the brat had caused more chaos than any other villain would ever be able to. His fuck-ups caused so much paperwork that it began to clog their own works. It did have the unintended side effect of exposing the dirty cops within the force. If they didn't help they were actually hindering their efforts and helping Durara, which they did with impunity, until it landed them in jail. Now Akio was faced with a dilemma. Five years ago he had the chance to pretty much hung Durara for his massive fuck-up during the docks operation, the one that costed them over fifty children that were never found. Hell Durara should be dead by his actions, but his daddy intervened. As usual, his threats were viewed at them time as all bark and no bite. Then his predecessor was killed in a freak villain attack. Thanks to the book he got from Midoriya, the fucking villain now had a name, they identified her by her quirk, and now he had a team of cops hunting her down, also with some vigilantes on the side who had a bone to pick with the bitch. Let it never be said that Akio Mineta doesn't use every possible advantage to get his prey. Vigilantes in Musidifu was a pretty way to say informants. The majority of them had weak quirks for combat, for intel gathering was another thing altogether. Eraser had employed them regularly when hunting his own prey which speaks volumes of their intelligence-gathering abilities. It will be a matter of time when he has that bitch in jail and singing like a bird on who ordered the hit on his predecessor. Only then he will rest well enough, that, and kick Durara to the curb and see his father lose the position of mayor of the city. But until that day he has to endure the brat, even if he wants to get a squad, 
all with shotguns and reenact the scene of Robocop just because he feels like making the bastards suffer beyond reason. Chief! Oh, he did not need this now. Looking up he saw his secretary, a woman with the body of a porn star and the mind of a seasoned detective, capable of squeezing a man or woman of their truths, by force if needed to. She looked panicked, and honestly, that made him panic as well, mostly because she is so well composed, she rarely panics, if at all. Chief! The news! Now! She called, Chief Mineta didn't have a TV on the office, he had a computer. But right now he had been working on a several files before he had to leave to Tokyo for the meeting the next day. Exiting his office, Chief Mineta eyes zeroed on the TV set on the wall, a decent flat TV that had been recently bought when the last one had broken down due to age and lack of maintenance. Dust does break everything. The TV was on, usually on the news channel. It played news of all Japan 24-7. It was a way to keep on with the current news of the country. Many would think it was unnecessary. They worked in Mizurifu. They didn't cover the whole country. But you never knew what would appear on the news that might help you on a case. It had happened too many times to count. But right now, the news was showing another thing entirely. The video of Izuka Midoriya's fight against the T-Doll and winning. Who the fuck? Chief Mineta all but growled. Who leaked that video? He snapped. I'm gonna rip whoever leaked that video's nuts off and give them to a dog to eat. He added with venom. These amazing images of a kid fighting and winning against the Terminator doll, a powerful enforcer of the terrorist organization known as the Troop, were given to us by police officer Durara Honda, son of Mayor Ken Honda. Chief Mineta was angry now. He was boiling in rage. His ink-like hair began to bubble, forming actual bubbles of ink that bursted and stained his shirt whenever it happened. He wasn't the only one. As if they were one, every police officer let one single name out, in anger. Huandei! This video, alongside the shoulder-mounted cameras of the officers involved in a raid four days ago have been given to us kindly by Officer Honda as evidence of negligence of heroes during the raid. Mitsuki Bakugu was seething in anger, seeing Inko's state and the videos right now playing in the TV told her everything that had occurred to her during that night and why she hasn't communicated back. The gun on her hand told her everything she needed to know about the animals that had taken her friend and her son away and tried to use them as game. The face of utter rage on Izuka's own told her everything she needed to know, someone had finally pushed him beyond the breaking point so angry that it had overtaken him in every possible way. Uh, is izuka -kun fighting with a broken leg? Her husband Masaru asked, all while drinking coffee, a worried look on his face. Yes, Mitsuki replied, her knuckles white for all the clenching she was doing. Now she knew why Inko hadn't communicated when she learned the apartment complex freak destruction. She only hoped they were okay. According to Officer Honda, the two individuals in the video, one Inko Midoriya and her son Izuka Midoriya, are currently wanted for manslaughter and, is he for real? That slimy cocksucker mother dash. Fucker! Sir Knight I actually looked at Bubble Girl in utter shock, he knew she had a set of lungs and a sailor vocabulary that he had worked really hard to erase thanks to his tickle machines, models 1 to 20 were a bust, and now she really rarely cursed. Apparently this warranted it, and he wanted in. Motherfucker son of a whore twat sucking ass licking bastard. But she was cursing enough for everyone in the office, which were him, of course, Mirio, who seemed to have been experiencing an out-of-body experience thanks to Bubble Girl's cursing and Centipeter, who was inching oh so slowly to an exit, any exit, the window just five feet away of him seemed appealing enough. How that? Incompetent was able to do this without anyone noticing. Night I thought with a grimace, this was a bad scenario. It wasn't the worst scenario anyone could perceive, but still it was bad. What made things worse was how Durara Honda was obviously feeding the media fake information about the Midorias, how they were actual delinquents, like villains. Great fake news again, I thought we had gotten over this shit two centuries ago. His mind echoed with history lessons from his mentor, how he drilled him to differentiate truth from bullshit, 
How to ensure that the truth and only the truth reaches the people, not lies that are toxic and have a harder time to be removed from human minds. Bubble girl! Night Eye called loudly. I'll have a horse skull fuck him. I'll take that as a yes? Mirio uttered with some apprehension, not used to seeing his senpai so heated. Take Centipeter and go to the station and check the evidence vault. We need to know what he might have tampered with or leaked. Night Eye ordered. Blood for the blood gods. Can I take Mirio instead? Centipeter wondered. No, let's use her new energy for something productive. Strip the flesh. On second thought, take Mirio. Me, a bubble girl, will go to the Midoriyas. They leave tonight. Deku Katsuki hissed in something akin to hate and outrage, looking at his phone and the feed in it. Holy shit. The rest of the class was in a state of shock. It wasn't every day you used to taunt the equivalent of a natural disaster without this one lashing out in anger. In hindsight, they were lucky. But Bakuga wasn't seeing this. He was seeing something really different. All this time, all this time he has been fucking with us, fucking with me. Bakuga seethed with rage. Looking down on me, you piece of shit. Ah, uh, God, we dodge a bullet on this one. A random extra uttered on Katsuki's right. A bullet? Dude, try a rocket. He fucked everything on his path. Uh, Yuki, didn't you mess with him in Valentine's Day? Sending him fake secret admirer letters? Oh fuck. I just remember. I made him drop his bento once. It was Katsudan. He really looked ready to murder me that time. Uh, hate to break it to you, but he'll sell everyone on this room to Satan for Katsudan to be perfectly honest. I'm just glad he never picked a fight with Bakugu. Katsuki fists tightened small explosions forming under his clenched hands. Can you imagine the aftermath of that fight? Smoke oozed out of the gaps of his hands. He throws explosive flaming hammers, has extra arms that shoot out like rockets and screams so hard that he can ragdoll people five times his size. I've seen nuclear explosions less messy than what are you suggesting? Okay, stop being so dramatic, asshat. Motherfuckers, the lot of them, they are suggesting that Deku could beat me, me. He never had the balls to fight me. I can curb stomp him and anyone in my path. His thoughts were as violent as he was right now. He was not happy with anything that was happening right now. So, uh, who's gonna teach math now? The teacher who did that was captured in the raid. Pfft, who cares, never trusted the guy. Gave me creepy looks every time I turned a test in. Yeah, me too, so did Principal Honda. If something good came of all this, it's that they aren't around anymore. Yeah, Deku pulled one for us in that one. Man, now I feel like shit for treating him like shit. You're just saying that because his mom it's a crack shot. That and he's more powerful the dash. Don't say it, bro. You know it's true, but Kuga would have never lasted a minute against all that, and against the T-Doll, even less. Control you fucking self, these extras are just talking, they know shit. Maybe, but neither any of us. True. The conversation began to die out as their homeroom teacher entered the room, but in Katsuki's mind the conversation kept playing out like a broken record, that and every other conversation he had with Deku ever since. His anger kept growing, only because now there was the context that Deku had a quirk and never had he used it against him. Never, even when he was attacked by many, Deku didn't consider it using it against them. Was it because he thought them beneath him, that using his quirk against such, weaklings would be a waste? Katsuki Bakuga seethed, and for once in his life, raging out wasn't an option to let all his bundle emotions out, and regain a semblance of calm. For once in his life he didn't know what to do with himself. Son, that was inspired. Thanks, father but it will buy us little time. Durara stated with a shake of his head, looking to his father, he was the very spitting image of the man, but younger, his father's position and burden of responsibility had aged him, that, and two failed marriages. Indeed, this is not the world of two hundred years ago, they'll curb your exposure with facts, not to mention you painted yourself as a target, I do not like it. 
his father replied. You don't have to like it, father. I chose this and I was the best suited for the task. Durara answered then shook his head with some mirth. Still, I am sure the heroes would have stormed this place by now. I mean I am your son and a possible link as of why I did what I did, Durara stated. They are not fools, son, despite your hate for them and the fact they have contracts with companies and sponsors. Each hero is trained to near hone perfection for combat and investigation. The only reason criminality is so high it's because people think that their power alone will get them far. But no, I digress. Mayor Honda said with a sneer. If one thing heroes got right is that training Trump's talent. And that fool All Might has not made things better. His spiel that anyone can be a hero allows the academies to basically cherry pick the best from the best and turn them into perfect heroes. But also it works for us. Mayor Honda said with a smirk. Of course, those who can't make it, the rejected and resented, Durara said as he reached for his jacket pocket and pulled a vial out. Their hopes and dreams, poured out in a single moment, then destroyed. They make as many heroes as villains in a moment, Durara said with a smirk. Father and son remained silent for a minute. It was a comfortable silence they usually have with one another when things go their way. Right now it was. But there was the chance that it could change really quick really soon. Anyway, father, I must be off. The police will be here soon, and I still need to find the location of the Midorias and gather some troops, Durara said, making his father nod. Good, I'll try to run interference here. Just make sure you don't get caught beforehand. Find them. Make sure they don't testify, Mayor Honda ordered. I have seen the bare bones of what they are planning. If we let the Midorias testify, it will open the Congress a door to crack on us. Hard, we cannot allow it to happen. The fate of this country rests in your hands, son. I know what's at stake, father. No, you do not. Mayor Honda snapped back. You are young, you do not understand or have seen how quirks have torn our humanity apart, those abominations that people now flaunt as something human, and we know it is not, it is stagnating us. Mayor Honda snapped. My work with the troop. Our family work into making this city into a launching port for our crusade against the very heart of this deceased society will not be stopped, no matter who stands in its way. Not All Might, not the Kappa. The Pillar Men tried and they died and we used their corpses for our purposes. Mayor Honda snapped. His son simply nodded. It was usual for his father to go on rants like this. And not even that brat will stop us. We will stamp every obstacle in our way. Mayor Honda declared hotly. Durara smirked on the sides. His father was right. It was about time to end the era of quirks across the globe and replace it with something worth following to, worth fighting for. But to that to happen, they needed to end the Midorias. If they as much testified a word, then all would be over. Inko Midoriya had to die. Izuka Midoriya had to die. The little girl with white hair had to die. Anyone opposing their way had to die. Now to find them an exact justice, troop justice. No one escapes their justice. Papa, what temperature you reckon those hammers have? Above 5,000 degrees, I am more interested in the fact it's solid. Above 5,000? Papa, that's the temperature of the sun's surface. I know, and he bathes in fire. I think it's nuclear fur, did he just stop time? With words alone apparently, what an interesting ouch that gotta hurt, he's butchering that tea doll. Don't act as you're not enjoying this papa, you hate tea dolls. So do you and everyone on the island, Melissa. Melissa Shields simply shook her head, adjusting her walrus-shaped nightcap, it looked like it was eating her head, and her baggy night clothes, ready to turn the day when the news of Japan had reached the island about a troop attack and a raid carried by the heroes there. The troop and Ireland had differences, it was putting it mildly, while Ireland focused on the progress of both heroes and human society trough the study of quirks and technological upgrades. The troop used technology to subjugate and create a technocracy based on the ideals that quirks were horrible mutations and everyone with one had to be purged. It was almost the Imperium, but with less skulls and no god emperor and with more zeal and no broken space marines just a shitload of bows that were in fact video game monsters. Melissa Shield, 
one of the young prodigies of Ireland, it's a huge nerd, comes with the territory of being an inventor. So the first time she laid eyes on a picture of a BOW, she realized that it was in fact a video game monster. She told her dad, he believed her of course, that and the pictures she had of the creature compared to the real ones backed her up. So did the higher ups of the island, it's everybody else who doesn't believe, bunch of jackasses, the evidence is there. Now apparently, the world was seeing what she was seeing. Wait a minute, Melissa said out loud, catching her father off guard. Despacito, rewind 9.8 freeze frame. The image began to turn back and then froze. Amplify, vector 5.6. It zoomed to the image of Izuku. That's a hammer of soul, she intoned in a bored tone. Those are siren arms, ha, huh? she said in a deadpan tone. David Shield was getting worried. Melissa was quiet, too quiet. He has gaming powers! She screamed in shock, then her shock died out, only to be ignited once more when she realized something. He stopped IT me with his voice. He has the THUM. The what? Night had fallen in Muzutafu, a reprieve of the chaos that had inundated the city in the morning thanks to Durara's Honda leakage of classified information. It was a grim reminder of the WikiLeaks scandals, but minor, and with actual reasons besides covering several crimes of war no one was prepared to find out. The very fact this was leaked to the media had put Honda firmly on the police's shit list. His search was still going and he no longer belonged to the force. They had questioned his father, but no one believed they hadn't met prior. Even if he was the mayor of the city, it could only protect him so much until it couldn't anymore. Reason why two cops were currently shadowing him, to ensure he didn't try anything. Of course they had permits for this too, the fact they fought crime didn't meant they had to lower themselves to their standards. So many criminals had gotten away because a cop did things that borderline to illegal and a competent lawyer destroyed them with that single mistake. This was a mistake they couldn't afford to make, there was so much at stake. Detective Nao Mesa glanced around, the parking lot of UA was... In theory the perfect place to carry the moving of Himidori is away of the city. The media couldn't get here. The students were already away in their homes, with only the staff inside the halls of the institution as witnesses of what was happening. Recovery girl, lunch rush and power loader having to stay until late due to the very nature of their works, were about the only witnesses, alongside Principal Nedzu who was preparing several plans to run against the troop. Nedzu didn't have an overarching, painful history with the troop, he just hated out of principle, they made horrible experiments, he hated people who made horrible experiments, ergo the hate, unlike the people of Ireland, he knew how to hide it, unlike the islanders who want to wear the collective entrails of the troop around their necks. Nao Mesa actually shivered, he was sending the Midoriyas out of the city. He never told them where, and with who they would spend the next two months. The wild, while pussycats had been kind enough to allow this, especially with the baggage they had on their own, the water hose had been the sister team of the pussycats. Despite their differences in names and dress code, both teams were rescue specialists first, not fighters. It made the tragedy of the water hose duo even more so painful, and the escape of muscular, despite the lack of an eye, or half a face, even more so pressing to attend. How are they taking it? Night I asked the detective, walking to the side of the law enforcer. Partly well, Midori Yakunitz, well-ish. When news got out he slipped into the void and I meant it literally. He began glowing purple and floating and shit. He had to restrain himself actually. He admits his control over arc and solar light is superior to void light. Reason why he slipped into it by accident. Nao Mesa confessed. It was kinda funny. Until his void light began to let us hear the whispers of the dead, it was scary, fucking scary. Are you sure it was the dead of the hospital? Midori Yakuin never mentioned something of the sort on his notes about the light, especially void light. He wrote it affects gravity, not talk with the dead, Night I said. He said the exact same thing. The thing was that the voices were calling for Yagi. Night I actually looked at Nao Mesa in shock. Yeah, good thing the kid didn't knew his real name. But Yagi was spooked, recovery girl too, especially when they recognized one of the voices, Nana's. Dear God, 
Night Eye was shocked beyond belief. He somehow tapped into one for all. It's Yagi's and Recovery Girl's theory, the light it's a power casual force, so alien that interacting with something as alien and one for all must be a breeze, natural, he tried with the other spectrums, arc and solar, but didn't have the same effect as void, Neo Mesa stated. Indeed, Sir Nighttime muttered, his mind going miles an hour, one for all was one of the rarest quirks around, stockpiling power per user, all might was number eight and this power had allowed him to take down the powerful all for one and his collection of ancient and powerful quirks. The very fact that somehow another quirk was able to interact with one for all in such an intimate way made him worried. Objectively this shouldn't worry him, it was an isolated incident, even as Zuka seemed to admit it, his control was shoddy at best of that particular power, so there was no possibility that it might happen again. But the reality was another, there was another quirk that interacted with one for all. Literally there were just one quirk that could interact with a quirk directly, Izuka's quirk. All for one could not do the same. The fact that Izuka's quirk, he needs to name it, allowed one for all former wielder to actually communicate, or something close to, seemed to validate a theory he had about one for all. It didn't simply stockpile power, it stockpiled a person as a whole. Or at the very least it stockpiled it until one for all was passed on, creating a shadow within the quirk, in a sense. One for all kept a wielder alive by keeping its memories within the quirk, and possibly their quirks as well. If the shadows within one for all were aware of this he couldn't tell, of if the former wielders knew of this was also a point of debate. Jiagi never explained this to him, when he revealed the nature of one for all to him, and who had been his master, the wielder number seven. Nana Shimura, also known as Nanamite, the strongest woman in the world, it was no joke, there were very few videos of her, and the accounts of her deeds were mostly mouth to mouth with some paperwork here and there, but not the list of criminals she brought down, that list is well taken as the emperor's lineage. Over 500 arrested villains, nothing to scoff at, if you didn't look at the dates it happened, those 500, all arrested in the span of a month, not even Yagi could break that record, no one had, Endeavor tried, his record sits at 200, Yagi tried, his sits at 400, no one in the world has been able to. There was reason she was called the strongest woman in the world. Then all for one killed her in combat, it was a sobering thought that the woman that stopped so many villains was Kilno, butchered by that animal, he had seen the pictures of the battleground, of her autopsy. All for one was an animal, there was a reason she was cremated on a closed casket, she wasn't presentable for anyone, the coronary claimed he had nightmares for months after her autopsy, not even the victims of Moonfish had done such feat. This reinforced his ideas and plans regarding Izuku and Mirio, Mirio would inherit one for all, this, coupled with his permeation would make Mirio nigh unstoppable, and if his theory about one for all stockpiling quirks, would make Mirio a literal monster when it came to combat. For Izuku it was another matter. While his quirk was an obvious analog to all for one, it had some flaws, more precisely how many powers it could have until it reached its limit, that in Izuku itself. While he knew Izuku had already a detailed list of what he wanted to upgrade himself, he read my quirk and many terms went over his head. Izuku was very conscious that he was way behind his peers in terms of quirk control. He was making leaps and bounds but everyone else his age had 10 years of advantage over him. He had planned to at least add 11 power-ups, a combination of power, flashiness and actual stealth, ensuring him to actually cover many spots that heroes tended to be lacking, in this case support, he was aiming himself to be able to not only fight in the front lines, but be some sort of combat medic and considering what he had planned and what he had researched on his own, it might be possible for him to fill that role. Not to dismiss his position as a powerhouse, he had already proven he was more than capable for combat. The only thing he needed was some polishing. Okay, he needed more than a polishing. He had self-esteem issues. He might not show them when there is need of action. But he had them thanks to the 10 years he spent as a quirkless individual. Current events had changed him, giving him some backbone. But it was a long road before it could be said that Izuku was confident in himself. But when Izuki gets confident, or when he does, and gets into Yue, 
Oh, then things will get interesting. Things won't change, at least for the moment. Night I commented to Naomesa. Right now we have to focus on our secondary targets. Strike while the iron is still hot. The Sheha Saikai. Naomesa agreed. Ares' information has greatly helped us. We have located their base of operations, established a perimeter and a surveillance. We are being very careful on this one. She was adamant on how dangerous overhaul is. Naomesa confessed. I cannot stress how dangerous this operation will be, Night I stated. I did some digging on the aliases she provided. We are not dealing with the average drunk with power villain. They are committed and ready to kill when given the chance. We'll have to plan this carefully. Naomesa nodded at Naitai's assertion of the situation. Yes, but now this will be a search, destroy and capture operation. Nothing like the Colosseum. Once we have their schedules, we'll strike. Naomesa said with a smile. Good. Any ideas of what agencies are going to join for this? Naitai wondered. I was planning for yours, Ryukyu's and Fat Gums. Endeavor is also willing to send people, but he refused to join. You know fire in enclosed spaces might not be a good idea, but he recommended Edge Shot for speedy takedowns, and All Might agreed to join the raid as well. After all he has one more Yakuza to deal with before he retires. Naitai chuckled at Naomesa's attempt to make light of All Might's situation. Then again he was responsible for the near annihilation of the Cosa Nostra when he was in the States, what he left behind the local heroes and police officers finished off. The Yakuza would follow the fate of the Mafia. With a sigh both men went to the parking lot of UA. The area was usually empty and unused, most students don't even had a vehicle, and the teachers all mobilized via bicycles, or Uber, so this area usually sat empty. But it was required to exist due to law, so the only use they gave it was for the buses UA usually has for their trips. In the parking lot right now sat a bus, it was a usual trans-municipal bus, Made for long trips from city to city, the marking of one of the many companies that employed these buses was displayed proudly on its sides. If you didn't look hard enough and knew little, this bus was the last bus of a company that went bankrupt five years ago, but since it had been more due to competition rather than corruption, hardly anyone knew about it, just the scattered news on paper, and that was it. For anyone around, it was another bus, it served them perfectly. Night I spotted the Midorias easily. Mother and son were carrying whatever bags they had of clothes that had survived the destruction of the apartments. Two bags each, alongside a third bag that was for Ares' new clothes, mostly light clothes and underwear, and an adorable All Might onesie he approved, and old but reliable. You can't go wrong with All Might onesies. All that Izuku had asked was already loaded on the bus on a plastic box. Properly marked, the controller had been hard or as hard as they tried it to make, he only asked for one generic controller. Power Loader ended up making one when he found out Izuka melted one with temperatures that were the equivalent of the surface of the sun. Why? Because he had free time and wanted to do something that would let him unwind. A controller was easy enough to relieve stress. Apparently he had some explosive-oriented students this year. The books had also been placed on his office. They had been interesting readings. Interesting enough that right now they were placed behind a fake wall, behind a bookshelf, and the only way it could only be opened was with his handprint and a set of keys he and Bubble Girl had. They were interesting, but in the wrong hands they could be dangerous. Thankfully his last book was written in code or better said another language, completely. That book was right now within the plastic box alongside the drive and his console. It was obvious it was the book regarding his quirk, and he trusted no one but himself to read it and write it, and properly translate it. Good, very good. He was well aware of what he had on those books and sought the way to ensure no one would misuse the information within. With a nod of his head, Naomesa motioned Night Eye to follow him where the bus and the Midoriya's were. Midoriya-san, Naomesa said once he reached Inko, the woman actually glancing up as Izuka helped with some other items to load up. This will the last time we will see each other until the trials. He mentioned, reaching for his trench coat pockets and pulling a folder, and handing it to her. This are the legal papers that grant you guardianship over Eri-chan. Right now she exists in the system simply as Eri, 
also covered under the incognito clause like you and your son, if overhaul, by any way kidnaps her, provided he survives your son or you, will have to face severe justice. Even more so as areas covered under the VIP clause. Nao Mesa explained. How severe are we talking about? Inko wondered. Death sentence severe, fast-tracked, and with his rap sheet, I'll say even faster, if possible. Nao Mesa explained, seeing Izuku approach his mom, Arianto, clad in an adorable red dress, a white shirt with a frilled collar, gray thighs and oversized tan boots, a far cry from her original clothes. One last thing before you leave, aside from the hero team that has agreed to host you in, another hero will accompany you. We don't know the nature of Ares' quirk, but at her age it can be assumed it is volatile, so he will be around to stop any activation that might get out of control, also he will act as extra security. And in the offset that someone gets past him, Midoriya-san, there is a gift from one of the SWAT officers on one of the boxes, black. Inko nodded, knowing full well what it might be inside that box. Midoriya-kun, Izuku turned his head. Your literary the last line of defense, you got full authorization to use your quirk if anything else fails, and you might consider naming it. It's giving some guys a headache just to refer to it as his quirk it gives, Kappa vibes. Izuku nodded, full aware of what he was told, and the power handed to him. He was not going to misuse it. Very well, if all goes fine, none of you will have to fight, you'll only need to testify, then everything will be fine. Nao Mesa promised, making the Midoriya's nod. Night Eye simply nodded at the trio. There was little to be said here. Only the assurance that everything would be fine, despite the fact that anything could go wrong. The fact Nao Mesa gave Inko a gun and pretty much gave Izuku carte blanche to use his quirk in the case of an attack if the chips were down told him a lot of what could go wrong. With a sigh he turned to the driver of the bus. You look lively, Night Eye said with a small smirk. He raised her head just gave him the silent equivalent of fuck off as he blinked tiredly. Although Night Eye knew the man was wide awake, he was just giving the appearance of being dead tired. He honestly had no excuse, he expelled the whole class this year, so he had a lot of time to sleep and recover from the all-nighters he pulled as an underground hero, that and enough caffeine to overdose an elephant. After the small stare-off, he raised her head, while Shuyuta Aizawa simply sighed. Nedza basically guilt-tripped me into this, said I was the logical solution for this situation. The underground hero groaned. And the fact you expelling a whole class, again, when each one of them were talented enough didn't made Nedzu and the board mad enough to consider sending you away so you can reflect on your actions. Night Eye smirked as Aizawa seemed to sour at that. They had no talent as far as I saw it. You need to stop seeing things in an underground way. Two of them had minor healing quirks that could be used on others. Thanks to you now those two are in Ketsubutsu. Aizawa didn't need a reminder. He had expelled a class. As usual because none showed talent or potential for being a hero. It wasn't until Nedza called him to his office he realized he was in deep. Those twenty kids, pro heroes and underground heroes had recognized them as potential heroes. Not only that, those two kids that got in with recommendation. It was so because of their healing quirks. They were so rare that any healer was protected with jealousy. Villains would kill to get a healer. As most of their own were, ethically untrustworthy, even for villain standards, and their own safety. Once word got out, shit hit the fan, to make stories short, those heroes had to work overtime to enroll those kids in other schools and ensure none of them turned villain. What Aizawa had done and told them, about not having potential, well, it had happened before across the world. Suffice to say that there was enough evidence to safely say that the Spartan way doesn't work in modern times. And while Yue had a reputation for doing things their way, and training some of the best heroes there had been in Japan and the world at large, it had also a reputation thanks to Aizawa, for weeding even the best prepared to enter Yue. Obviously it had finally reached its breaking point with this last class, to anyone looking without knowing the context. Sending Aizawa with the Midoriyas was an extra security measure. For Night Eye, this was punishment. They were sending him away to cool his jets and think things through and realize that his actions and words do have consequences. 
all while the same time doing protective duty. Of course Naitai knew Nedzu well enough to figure out that the rat slash dog slash bear was also interested in Izuku. A quirk like his was something that happened once every blue moon, the very versatility of it would assure a powerful hero, or a dangerous villain. Then there was Eri, someone so important the Yakuza was willing to break their own protocols and declare open war if she wasn't returned. Of course it was because of her blood, but Night I had a feeling there was something else. They'll have to wait until Chronostasis wakes up to ask him about what Eri truly meant for the Yakuza. Izuku did gave him quite a beat down. Sai, are you done taunting me? Aizawa asked with a frown. No, I could go on all day long, but we don't have that luxury. Night Tai joked with a smirk, one that changed immediately. I don't need to tell you this, but the Midoriyas are a key component into taking down over 50 gangs with numbers that oscillate between 20 to 100. Uncover a web of corruption that seems to begin in Aldera and ties the Yakuza and the troop, even elements within the government. Elements that are willing to do anything in their power, endangering themselves in the process, as long as the Midoriyas don't live to testify. Naitai reminded. Aizawa grunted. I know well enough, I know what's at stake. He reminded Naitai. You don't seem to, considering that even Ireland is on this as well. One month and two weeks in the camp. Then an island delegation is coming to pick them up and cater them to island for further protection until the day of the trial. It's already set up. Now it's the waiting game. Naitai added, making Aizawa eye him up. The erasure hero simply shook his head. The troop in Ireland, a T-Doll forced to retreat and an army of bows butchered, apparently by the hands of the problem child, Aizawa stated. I hardly consider calling him problem child when most of this began when Queen B tried to force her rhetoric on him and had a friend of his almost raped, on school grounds, not shy a meter away of him, after she broke his leg, Naitai reminded. Aizawa bit his answer back, it was technically true, all this mess started because of that girl and had forced the Zukumiteria to retaliate, and in doing so had declared war against the troop, then again massacring their bows pretty much dismantling a T-Doll and crippling one of their operatives all while forcing the hand of another was pretty much the insult after the declaration. With a shake of his head, Shouyuta went to the bus, entering it and instantly taking the driver's seat, the Midori is following after packing some last items. Nothing was said as the bus doors closed and the bus began to move onwards, leaving the premises of UA, no one being the wiser. Tomorrow, reporters would once again swarm the police station and hero agencies, hounding the people there for answers on the whereabouts of the Midorias, not knowing by that time they would be far away, none the wiser. Inside the bus, Izuku just smiled as Eri sat on his mother's lap, gazing at her with the closest thing she could muster as a smile. They still were trying to teach her how to smile. It was a slow process, but there was progress. Then, after she learns how to smile, He'll teach her the all smile no kid should spend their childhood without smiling like all might. That's a crime he's willing to correct. With a smile he reached for the book on the box, alongside his computer's hard drive and his console. Opening it up, Izuka slightly smiled. I know that smile, Inko said as Eri looked at Izuka curiously. You're planning to add something else, aren't you? Izuka just smiled more. Another power? Izuku simply nodded at Eri's question. What kind of power? She asked again. He pondered her question for about a second. Oh, Eri-chan, here's a free biology lesson. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, he said with a smile, gazing at the book. Oh, he has plans, he has plans. The troop would come to regret ever messing with him. They would come to regret ever meeting him. The screen kept showing him something unique. Something amazing. Something dangerous. The creatures intrigued him, but they weren't masterpieces like his. No, but he wasn't about to diss an exemplar work of bioengineering just out of ego. He recognizes talent, and whoever created those creatures was talented. But those creatures weren't his gnomus, they weren't perfected. This kid, however, was he the answer? Was he the answer Sensei was looking for so long? The answer to the question that was plaguing the scientists in the world? 
With a sigh he reached for a button on his console, one of the monitors lit up instantly, showing the face of Sensei. Doctor, you caught me at an odd time. Sensei, I think I found it. The doctor said, his voice a mere whisper, but one Sensei heard well. The man on the other end of the monitor didn't move for a while, his frame hidden by shadows, then he began to close up to the monitor's camera. The doctor saw Sensei grin. Tell me more. Chapter 7, Setting the Stage Twenty years ago we lost our most advanced mech to a bunch of psychopaths and anarchists, who repurposed it for combat. They violated our work to suit their needs. As of right now Ireland is at war against the troop. David Shield still remembers that day very vividly. He had been just an intern, yet to meet All Might. The heads of Ireland had called for a meeting that had been televised across the island. Twenty years ago they had built their greatest invention yet, a multi-purpose mech, a robot at you will, designed to aid, a medic, a firefighter, a lifesaver, it had been built with the sole intention of saving lives. They had dubbed it Marionette a marvel at engineering, so advanced it was that three of the five departments within the island had dedicated themselves to its construction, a unique AI suit that mimicked a human mind to a T. An endoskeleton based on the old Terminator franchise but built by actual engineers and actually functional with a fake skin that covered it completely, a wealth of information in medicine and science to help people, an enhanced strength to help people trapped in rubble and if needed, fight back. That was just scratching the surface of the island's masterpiece. Then the troop attacked. No one knew how they had infiltrated their defenses at the time, only that when the marionette had been loaded into a plane, they were already in, waiting. Their product never made it to its destination. A year later, a base in El Paso, Texas was attacked by what would be dubbed as Terminator Dolls. Their remains reached Ireland to see if there was a structural weakness in them that could be exploited. The team that checked it out were horrified when they learned that the T-Doll was in fact a butchered version of the marionette. The troop had stolen their creation and turned it into a weapon of war. So yeah, people in the island were pissed. Then they learned that someone, aside from All Might or any other powerful hero, had nearly destroyed a T-Doll and made it run away or made its handlers yank it off certain doom. Now this would not be much of a problem. Terminator dolls were strong, no doubt, but they were as flawed as their creators, being crude copies of a marionette which was better designed than the crude Terminator dolls. The problem was that the T-Dolls were constantly upgraded. They might not look like it, but they are constantly upgraded. Their endoskeletons, which were an aberration of synthetic and natural bones, had begun their lives as a titanium composite and ceramic that also had calcium in them. The arm of the T-Doll is Zucumitary and nearly killed and was sent to them as per usual agreement, was a titanium slash colton alloy with the usual calcium-like ceramic embedded here and there. To give it a more human look and feel, this was a new development. The endoskeleton had been upgraded. The skin too, of what was left of it. Apparently even this upgrade wasn't enough to withstand the temperature of the surface of the sun, or higher, and explode as well. The upgraded bones didn't fare better, kinetic force alone had ruptured them, and their molecular bonding was for the lack of better word, non-existent. Another attack like that would have vaporized them on the spot, leaving nothing but ash, and even then that was debatable. After Melissa had went to bed, David had been called by the higher-ups, alongside many of the bigger scientists of the island. They were presented the remains of the T-Doll's arm, and what had happened to it, alongside the unfiltered video of its fight against the Zucumitaria. Conclusions and hypothesis about his quirk, what quirks came abound, what they were, what they could do, and why in God's great name it didn't have a name, and oh my God it was just a month old of being registered. David had been already hypothesizing with his daughter when she had her own meltdown, the fact she seemed to recognize three of the things Midoriya did seem to cement this, after the meeting was done, and was conceded to be repeated, in the morning, after a healthy breakfast and some shut-eye. David began his own investigation. Three words that Melissa had used had drew his attention. Hammer of soul, siren arms and Thursday um. Okay Google, fail me and I'll hack you in the 90s. David promised as he typed the first words. 
the images of a silvery hammer with the shape of a bird but the end of an actual maul, and with a short grip came first, then of course the lynx. There were three, and all were old, very old, so old that the last time someone edited one was a hundred years ago, yet it showed traffic. He saved them and wrote the next one. Again the same, this time the image of a buff woman with six glowing arms, just like Azuka's coming out of her back. Alongside mentions to a borderlands whatever it was, it was tied to the arms, so he saved those links too. He went for number three, Thursday um, and the image of a dragon and the image of a man screaming so hard that waves could be visible were the first thing he saw, again there were few links, more than the other two combined, a link to a nexus, two Wikipedia pages, and a video, all old, very old. Maybe his daughter's theory was right, it was a game-based quirk, Odd, most quirks of that nature appeared on Korea and China, and as far it was known, they were some of the most obstinate quirks no, complicated to the point that most who got them actually tamed them by sheer force of will and math, lots of math. But none of them displayed the kind of powers Midoriya showed. Perhaps it's a mutation, David thought, it would make so much sense, gamer quirks were among the most powerful due to their unpredictable nature, they could take the form of an RPG or a gotcha game, a dating simulator jammed with a shooter, or a fighting game mechanics so realistic and magic mechanics so broken. But they all had something in common. They had a HUD and a status screen pretty much shoved in the eyeballs of the user, it was permanent, and the skills they inevitable unlocked, were tied to the game they were mimicking. If it was an RPG, then it would have some RPG powers in it, a shooter, that person would be a crack shot, a fighting game. That person would be a close-quarter monster, but it all boiled down to numbers. Izuku Midoriya's quirk didn't seem to show any of those qualities and flaws, it seemed to simply jump that obstacle altogether, which would explain why he seemed so overpowered, but there was more, David was sure of it. The severed limb of the T-Doll exuded a ridiculous amount of radiation, exotic radiations that simply made no sense. The guys back in experimentals were in ecstasy on with these new, rare and apparently, incomprehensible readings they were getting. David simply shut his computer off and went to bed, it might look like a strange thing to do, considering who he is it might look unprofessional. But honestly, after a lifetime of work, if he had learned something was that trying to work tired was a sure recipe for disaster. Better to rest and let the brain chill than try to push it past its limits and make sloppy mistakes. Besides, Izuka would come to Ireland in a month and two weeks. His quirk was so rare, so unique that he was asked to come, alongside his family. Of course there were ulterior motives. After all enemies of the troop had to stick together. Shoyuda could not tell why. But seeing the kids suddenly glow a rich purple that seemed to swallow the darkness of the night that uncompensated the bus was unsettling. He had seen many unsettling things in his time as a pro, the freakiest. That five-year-old kid that had a slender man-like shadow for a quirk and was actively hunting pedophiles. But the problem child manipulating what he called void and slowly training so he doesn't have any mishaps was unsettling in its own way. Not because of the training, in on itself seems normal, just holding what seemed to be the energy itself between his hands and manipulating it to take shapes and slowly spinning it until it has enough speed then decreasing it and doing it again. The fact it makes little to no sound from where he is makes him uneasy. Silence tends to be a prelude for an attack in his opinion. What made him uneasy was the quirk of the problem child in on itself. Call him many things, lacking information wasn't one of them. The boy's little tussle with the troop was news on the deep web. His informant, who hates coffee, the Philistine, had paged him regarding the news of the Colosseum raid and its aftermath. Aside the mess Durara Honda had made, surface-wise things were normal. Another loose-lipped cop wanting some attention and letting it out to the closest reporters he can get his hands on. Problem was that this was not any normal cop. This was the son of the mayor of Muzurifu who had caused havoc on the police image for the past ten years and had caused the deaths of both pro-heroes and cops. Eraserhead by principle alone hated him, an incompetent mook placed in a position that he could not handle, lacking potential and... Eraserhead took a deep breath, 
because, in his anger for seeing someone without potential had not seen the signs of something else, Niza had told him so. His narrow sight blinded him of what lay beyond what he was seeing. In this, he hated Durarahanda more, because his babbling had stirred quite a hornet nest in the underworld. On one hand, we got criminals that had adapted to the underworld and knew how it runs, the Colosseum had been one of the linchpins in many of their operations of the small timers and big shots alike. Now it was gone, and none of them would dare to go against All Might, Endeavor, Merkel, or the heroes that spearheaded the raid. They would certainly try with the cops, if rumors were correct some criminals were planning a gun plan on cops. Any cop, each dead pig would yield a hundred thousand yen, an incentive to cause death and chaos. Those were the ones mad because their operations were crippled. They would certainly try to re-establish somewhere else, if the heroes and cops weren't striking their crippled operations while they were on the ground, standard operation here, keep them grounded until they got them by the balls. It was the same strategy used to destroy the Yakuza families, multiple heroes, on multiple fronts, until nothing remained, scorched earth policy. Those were the greedy mooks, then we got bona fide villains, who had ties within the Colosseum members, they knew better than to try anything that might get them in jail, especially with all the heroes around, and everyone had seen what problem child had done to that Terminator doll, the doll could take the punishment. A human being getting mauled as the T-Doll did, not so much, but many would try. There were bounties on the Midorias, extremely obscene bounties that Eraserhead and Niza had seen and could not believe. Officially the Midorias had the third highest bounty on their heads, just behind Endeavor and All Might. Because of course those two would get one. This was why he vouched for heroes to be fully underground, but people listen, no, they have to have flashy heroes because we need symbols. It made him physically ill, they needed to protect people, and by working in the light they can't, only in the shadows they can truly do their work. Which led to the third problem the underworld had now with the Midorias, the troop, the biggest, and considered to be the only terrorist organization at the time. If what was being told in the underworld was led to believe, greedy criminals angry at losing their pays and villains hungry for money was the least of the problems for the family. There was an Order Omega on the Midorias, a death order, the troop was going to send T-Dolls from this point on alongside Bows, all with the objective to kill the family, they would not stop, never stop until their targets were dead, and to make it worse, once the deed is done, they would mass stream it all across the world. They did the same with the Pillar Men, 30 years ago, their deaths, were not kind. All in the hopes of breaking anyone that dared to defy them, governments, armies, Heroes, civilians, even villains, they had said it before, no one will stop them, no one. Yet there he was, a kid that had trashed a tea doll, their bows and escaped with knife flesh wounds, crippled two apparent direct collaborators of the troop and was exponentially getting stronger. That unnerved him, his quirk was growing stronger, Niza hasn't shared anything about the quirk in question, only that it was, in his words interesting. When Niza says those words, you better be fucking worried. Aizawa knew that he would learn what that quirk could do in reality. To be able to challenge the troops' troops, pun of words aside, and come on top was something only pros could brag about. The kid had the potential of becoming a monster. Eraser had hated that kind of potential. Looking at the back mirror, he bit down the urge to shudder. He makes people shudder not the other way around. When he saw Izuka looking at him, then the kid smiled and went back to his exercises. Yeah, this is going to be a long month, I can feel it. Eraser had thought with a grimace, at least he would be able to sleep peacefully, the woods are silent enough for a power nap. Location Tokyo's Police Department, Morning Sir Knight I eyed at the congregation before him the first of many meetings in the upcoming months regarding the Colosseum raid and the subsequent raids that will be carried against troop locations, points of interest and their allies because the troop doesn't have allies, they don't do allies. There was of course the Minister of Defense, a rather short man, barely Azuka's own height, but what he lacked in height he made with muscles, like many muscles, his quirk was muscle overgrown, his entire musculature was jacked up, to the point many believed he was on steroids, but that wasn't the case, this was just his quirk on work. 
he represented the military branch that had aided them in the raid. The second person was the chief of police of Muzidifu, Akio Mineta, again the same height as the minister of defense, the man's quirk was on his hair. His hair was pretty much a semi-solid inky substance, incredibly sticky, and he was on control of it. So anyone who touched his hair would feel like touching gelatin or would have their hands stuck by his choosing, he of course represented the police force of Mizurifu. Then there was Yagi Tashinori, none of them expected All Might to be present and represent the heroes that participated in the raid. But everyone knew that heroes had a very busy schedule, especially with the chaos Honda unleashed on Muzurifu and the villains that seemed to never stop. As a result, most of them could not participate. The answer. All Might had sent someone to represent them all, the sickly-looking man that seemed to tower over everyone on the room and was one cough away of dying. Of course, they didn't knew that the man was All Might itself, in the room currently. Only Night Eye and Niza knew of this. Speaking of the dog-slash-bear-slash-cat ultra-intelligent animal, he was sitting right at the side of Yagi, despite holding the position of Principal of Yue, Niza's ultra-sharp mind and intelligence would serve them well for what lay ahead. For who better in the room to plan the best course of action than the being that possibly had at least five plans in motion, and was making five more while the conversation was going. Then there was the last person, the shadow of the Emperor of Japan, literally. His shadow was seated on a chair, but there was no body attached to it. This was the Emperor's quirk, Shadow Man, able to dislocate his own shadow from his body and use it as a medium. There was an apparent weakness of distance. So that meant the Emperor's body was nearby, and surely guarded. But this was way better. Shadows could be replaced. Flesh could not. Once everyone was seated, they could begin. Okay, first order of business. Who gets to kill Honda? Chief Mineta began, making everyone groan. No one, you shouldn't entertain murder, as justifiable it may be, the shadow of the emperor said, despite being a shadow, its voice was as natural as one of a human being. He leaked high sensitive material that had yet to be reviewed by anyone. The lawyers of the many captured during the raid are trying to use this to move the trials to an earlier date. Oddly enough, they seem to all want it at the same day. April 1st, this has me concerned, Night Eye stated. Indeed, it must mean they have something planned that day, or someone else has, Niza stated with a hum as he drank his tea in contemplation. That's a trap, the Minister of Defense barked out. Remember the 1st of November in Paris 10 years ago? Same delaying tactics, three lawyers on a case ask for the trial to be held that day. What happens? Total bloodbath. Five mass murderers escape custody, a judge is killed by one of them, two heroes are crippled for life, one hero dead and over 20 cops and 55 civilians dead or wounded of gravity. Of those five escapees, two were killed during their escape. A third made it as far as two blocks before crossing a street and getting run over by a truck, while the last two escaped, never to be seen again. All five were troop collaborators. He snapped. Fool me once shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We can't let it happen. He finalized. I concur. But you know the legal system, equal opportunity of defense. If they have the arguments, then it can be used against us as easily we can use the same system we created against them. The Emperor's shadow stated. We must use the tools given to us to repel this action, and any other that might endanger our witnesses. He added. The Midori is, Chief Mineta said as he tossed the file to the table. Model citizens, at least the mother and son, we haven't seen hide or hair of the husband in over 11 years. This is their updated files, including their quirk files, there is also a file of the girl. Airy in it. The Minister of Defense and the Shadow of the Emperor grabbed a file each and began to read them. Airy was a ghost before we got to her, no file. No birth certificate, nada. Right now she is under the legal guardianship of Inko Midoriya. No lawyer will stick their hands in this I am told, ironclad. Try to remove Ari of her legal custody without approval of the HPSC. Their licenses were the least of their concerns. Chief Mineta added. How they achieved this? The Minister of Defense asked. Their Yagi smiled. A truly inspired move. Ari's blood is currently classified as hazard level 5. 
Yagi stated, making the Minister of Defense look at him in shock. Level 5. Jesus, that only place for radioactive waste and biohazards. We know, Yagi stated, looking ashamed. But her blood warrants it. It is the key of the quirk destroying drug the Yakuza currently commercialize. We acquired a sample, or better said a whole clip with the gun during the raid. We matched it with a sample of hair of Ari taken during her time in the hospital. They match 100%. Her blood is the biological material found on every bullet made by the Shei Hasaikai. Yagi let that sink in. Say the time Tashinori, when the heroes are ready, I'll have a platoon of my best men ready to storm that rat nest, and we'll flush them out and hang them by their balls. The Minister of Defense Kenley remarked, it wasn't for naught, he was also a family man with the daughter of the age of Eri, and if those bullets could be used against heroes then so could be used against soldiers and civilians. Removing the manufacturers was a more sensible option than locking Ari away in a gilded cage. We are hoping for your support, thank you. Yagi agreed. I would have to run it with the HPSC, but considering the spotless record we have so far, I can say they will agree. Now please focus your attention on a medical record recovery girl did on the Midorias and Ari. Yagi called. The group did as so, and two minutes and they did a double take. Is, is this true? Chief Mineta asked. Yes, recovery girl double checked. Inko Midoriya's quirk somehow got stronger. Ari's horn, a possible outlet for her quirk now seems to be more solid, apparently larger considering her age, and sharper, sharp enough to go through fabric, bone and muscles like if they were paper. And there are indications that it might get longer and sharper. Night I stated, this how it occurred the emperor's shadow asked we are not sure but recovery girl has a theory it involves the projector that was nullifying their quirks at a painful level and azuka midoriya's light night i said light chief mineta wondered out loud is that his quirk light night i shook his head it's an aspect of it in short, he can generate and manipulate a spectrum of forces that he catalogued as par casual. During their capture he was drugged and according to Midoriya-san, he was letting light out, due to his body fighting against the drugs and the influence of Principal Honda's quirk, Phantasm. She assumes that Izuku's light interacted with them both. Eventually the projector was destroyed by Izuku, and all that energy that had been building on them began to concentrate it on the only thing that was affected by the projector, their quirks. Naitai explained. Thus the strange growth in their quirks, Chief Mineta muttered. Only a theory, but one that can be checked alongside the bullets in Ireland during their stay, Naitai said. As for the bullets, aside the fact they use Ari's blood as the main component, seem to do something else, Tashinori? The gaunt man nodded at Naitai. Preliminary studies show that the bullets don't suppress quirks, just as the name implies, it erases them. Everyone blinked, no exception. That's bullshit. That came of the Emperor's shadow. You can suppress quirks. Erasing them means taking apart what makes them what they are, and in essence what makes us. He added. Yes, you're correct. That's exactly what it does, Yagi replied. Studies carried out on victims of the bullets before and after show that when exposed to the contents of the bullets, their quirk factors simply vanish, then after the time limit passes by. Their quirk factors return. This led us to believe that Overhaul's plan is not suppression, but elimination. Yagi stated. Eliminate the quirk. Eliminate the hero. The Minister of Defense hissed. Wonderful. It's the Kappa all over again. He added. The only good thing about this mess is that it's temporal and the source sits out of Yakuza hands. Not quite, Niza muttered. I would wager that they have a surplus of Eri Chan's blood to experiment, but need fresh samples for their experiments to work, otherwise Eri Chan would not have so many scars. Niza said, glancing at the picture of Eri's arms, littered in scars no child of her age should have. Yes, recovery girl said something similar, Eri's DNA samples degraded faster than anything recorded, even when put in a freezer. Hair samples too, stands to reason this is why she was kept in captivity by the Shei Hasaikai. Night I mentioned. I cannot stress enough the danger of this group, possibly the last Yakuza family of considerable size. We need to take them down. 
Ah, the Minister of Defense stated. Never heard of samples going bad in a freezer. He added, You think her quirk, or all that experimentation messed her up? A probability. We don't know the extent of the experimentations done to her. Only the aftermath, the bullets and the scars on her arms and legs, not to mention she was missing small patches of skin when she was captured by the troop. Night I commented, this got the attention of those who didn't knew. She got captured and had skin harvested by the troop? Chief Mineta asked out loud. Yes, and apparently she got blood extracted and other fluids and something that made Izuka boil the hospital room he was in once he found out. Night I exclaimed. Boil? The shadow of the emperor asked. Okay melted in his defense it was justified. Night I stated. I would do too. Night I admitted, much to the shock of the occupants in the room. It wasn't every day you learned someone melted a room because something happened and the ever stoic Sir Night I admitted he would have done the exact same thing if he could. Aside the melting of a room, the Minister of Defense began. We might not be in a good position. The troop somehow acquired samples of the girl's skin and blood. By this point it must have degraded, but they must have done something with it. He stated, you all know that bows are the troops' favorite method of attack. Now imagine one of these creatures, being very capable of suppressing if not outright reversing a person's genes before he or she had a quirk. He let the statement sink in. Then it's obvious what must be done, the shadow of the emperor said. Yagi-san, coordinate with the other heroes, start striking down the Yakuza strongholds, bleed them down, Rikudo-san, prepare your best men for the raid. I want this overhaul alive and in pain, and if it isn't possible dead. The Minister of Defense, Rikudo Yagami nodded. Chief Mineta, I want you men to double down on possible operations of the gangs captured in your city, coordinate with other departments in other cities. We cannot let them regain their footing. I want to see on the news how the gangs are being hunted down one by one, no mercy. Chief Mineta nodded with a smirk. Naitai, continue your investigation. I want them devoid of resources, money, manpower, pride and hope by the time the raid carries out. Night I nodded with a smirk. Been doing that, Little Airy provided us with two bank accounts. We have linked them to offshore accounts in a bank and several tax havens and other accounts in those same havens. By the time the raid carries out, they will have no money to lean on. Night I promised. This satisfied the shadow of the emperor. Good, now for the troop and the meeting carried out. Izuka could not sleep. Excitement had set its roots firmly on his body, that a small amount of paranoia. For the whole trip he hadn't slept, not even a bit, concentrated more on his exercises on controlling the void light and not having any other accidents like in the hospital. He's still trying to figure out what happened. He knows that void light, while sounding something like a necromancer might use, was anything but that, it did tapped into forces that were between the vacuum of matter, basically dark energy. But it wasn't something evil at all. But there were no records of void light ever being used to communicate with the dead. Well, there was Savathan's song, but the void crystals were used to power up a portal, not communicate with Oryx's sister, Savathan. Then how that happened? The fact is Uku, and by extension everyone in the room had heard voices calling for someone named Yagi had freaked him out, he had a small theory about that. He might not have tapped into the realm of the supernatural, but rather may have tapped to someone's quirk instead. Which in on itself was even weirder, his quirk was getting weirder with each passing day, and he had it for one month and something. With a sigh he turned to see his mother and Eri, both were asleep, Eri curled on his mother's lap while Inko used her arms and makeshift blankets to keep Eri warm and safe. Both looked relaxed and safe, just like Izuku wanted it. His gaze slightly turned to the driver of the bus, one Shuyuda Aizawa. He knew he was a hero of some sort, probably underground due how he dressed. But the real question is who he really is as a hero, what's his quirk? What he can do? He works in UA, or at least has ties with the institution and with Principal Nizu, he seems haggard, tired, but Izuku knew the man was more than met the eye. Shouyuta Aizawa had been alert the whole trip, never letting his gaze wander anywhere but the road and from time to time to him, when he had been training his control over void light, 
The looks he gave him were concerning. Just what I needed, another adult that thinks he knows best. Izuku didn't meant to think like that. But in all honesty, the only adults that so far have proven to be actual, responsible adults whose opinion and words must be heeded because they speak sense are so far his mother, Sir Naitai and Detective Naomesa. He would include All Might too. But after what he saw in the hospital and his interaction with Recovery Girl, well, let's just say the nigh unbreakable pedestal he placed his idol in was cracked, just a little. In all honesty, he shouldn't feel this way against the man, who know what kind of stress he's in. But after all he had seen, Izuku was kinda justified in not trusting adults until they show how they really feel, how they act in reality, and what they really think about him. Nine years of taunts by both kids and adults. And the sudden boost of confidence thanks to his quirk appearing, or rather finally hitting the trigger for its activation, might have let some issues he might have with people that think that way. I need to stop thinking like that. Heroes don't think like that. Izuku amended himself, continuing his exercises of control. Then he felt the bus slowly slowed down. He looked up to the driver and saw he slowed down to take what he assumed was a dangerous curve. On a small car it would be dangerous. On a bus it would be worse. If you get us killed by trying to get a shortcut I'm going to atomize you. Izuku whispered, but to Aizawa, he might have been talking right next to him. Don't worry, they are waiting for us. Aizawa replied, not concerned with the fact the kid just threatened him with atomization. The kid just kept a steady glare on him, the glow of void light he held on his hands steadily growing. Then the road seemed to come to life, a bridge formed on their path, made of the earth around the road. Impressive, Izuka muttered, instantly clenching his hands together and consuming the void. Aizawa noted this, and how Izuku began to glow for some seconds as he looked around the newly formed bridge. Advanced terrakinesis, well trained too, to form a bridge, the support beams and collapsing it behind us takes concentration, training. Lots of training, terrain helps too, lots of earth for use, perfect for a quirk user with such a quirk. Izuku mumbled, unaware that Aizawa heard it all. All that from a glance? Aizawa thought alarmed. No, stay calm. This is not the first time you meet a quirk analyst, even if he's the youngest you ever met. Then Izuku did the equivalent of the scanner's scene to his brain, with his next words. Only six heroes in Japan have this level of control and terrakinesis-based quirks, but Terabolt and Quake are in a seminar in London, Avalanche and Dirt are in their honeymoon in Hawaii, Pixie Bob and Cobalt hate each other. But Pixie Bob is the only one with a team and oh my god we're meeting thrilled wild pussycats. Knees of who the fuck you put me with. Nice and easy Pixie. Mandalay muttered as she saw the earth bridge her teammate Pixie Bob form with her quirk, keep its precious cargo in a steady course to them. There we go, like in Yokohama. She called. You and I recall Yokohama very differently. The blonde cat maid themed heroine replied with snark. Considering you were spending your time between flirting and rescuing people I can see why. Tiger, a mass of beats of a man, who used to be a woman, replied with a gruff voice. Also keep your eyes on the bus, they survived the troop not only to die because you were distracted. He added with some mirth. Pixie Bob just growled but kept her eyes on the approaching bus. Tiger was right, they didn't survive the troop and a direct confrontation with a Terminator doll just to die out on a fluke. Their last member, Ragdoll just kept her eyes on the bus, her quirk already active to ensure that nothing beyond them would get through. How odd, she muttered, earning the attention of Mandalay. I sense four people, but one of them has, shifting weak points it's the best thing I can describe, she summarized. It's a human thing Ragdoll, Pixie Bob muttered. Joints are natural weak points, sore eyes, mouth, nose, groin. Hell pretty much a human body I a gigantic weak point but broken into parts. The blonde added. I thought you had already got over that. Me too, Mandalay added her two cents. What are you sensing? Must be the boy. His right leg show a massive weak point, considering it was broken recently and recovery girl healed it. I'm pretty sure it became a weak point by that alone. But, Ragdoll muttered. I'm seeing weak points that make no sense, like weak spots on his... Kidneys? 
Have you ever got punched in the kidneys before? Enough force can stop someone my size, Tiger replied. Ah, uh, the weak spot it's on top of the kidneys, Ragdoll clarified. The adrenal glands, what an odd weak point. You can't effectively hit the glands, the kidneys, yes, the glands not so much, Mandalay commented. What else you see? She questioned. Like I said, shifting, one moment it's in his hands, the next on his neck, the next it's his skin, then it's deep within his muscles. Only three spots remain permanent, the leg, the glands, and his mouth? Ragdoll muttered. Never seen something like this, not even with All Might, not even Endeavor. No wonder that T-Doll had so much problems fighting him. It couldn't reliably fight him head-on with so many variables. I'm more surprised that thing got away, Ragdoll said, a smile forming already. This month gonna be lit. Okay, who let her again on the computer? Pixie Bob muttered. Not now you two, we got guests. Mandalay replied, seeing the bus finally reach solid ground instead of the bridge Pixie made, and slowly stopping in front of them. Okay guys, showtime. Mom, Mary chan wake up. Izuka whispered close to the two. Both women began to stir. Eri was the first to actually wake up letting out a yawn that was way too cute to be legal, all while his mom began to stretch as she let out a satisfied sound as her joints cracked back into place. You didn't sleep one bit, didn't you? Inko muttered as she opened her eyes and Eri rubbed her eyes off. Izuka decided to look anywhere but his mom right now, she knew, just knew like that. He didn't, Aizawa replied. Pick your bags, we arrived. He said tonelessly as he stood up and began to move his neck, arms and legs, driving non-stop must had left him sore. I met special ops with more feelings than you are portraying right now. Inko muttered as she grabbed Eri and set her on Izuka's hands, all while she stood up. Feelings are non-rational and cloud judgment, was Aizawa's reply. Tell that to the T-Dom my son beat up with a feeling, Inko replied back with a smirk as she picked a pair of bags. Aizawa rolled his eyes, opening the doors of the bus and walking out first. Rude, Inko muttered, seeing Izuka picking the other bags and boxes with his siren arms, she let out a small smile. When this is over, me and Mitsuki-chan are going to take you to a shopping spree, Inko said with a small smile. Izuka didn't look exactly thrilled with the idea, however. I'll atomize myself, I'm no pack meal, he muttered. You have six extra arms and you're carrying in your normal arms the equivalent of your own weight with ease, except your fate. Guardians make their own fate. Not this one. Eri just snorted as she carried a small bag, just about the only thing Izuku allowed her to carry. He didn't want to put much pressure on her. With a sigh of defeat, Izuku simply walked onward with his load, Inko and Eri behind him, upon exiting the bus. However, his mood improved greatly when he saw who were outside. Omi go filled wild pussycats, he fanbud, actually slipping once more into the storm trance without noticing and floating, actually gaining the attention of the team in question. The earthy best rescued him theorized know they special easy in mountain or ski and between to furo of tempfi amount of retire so fresque experience. I'm 18 at heart, damn it. You're 30, just admit it. You look for someone with 30 years. Ragdoll you Judas. Mandalay just sighed, rubbing her head with her gloved hands. God give me strength. She muttered, seeing Izuku, still floating and letting streams of lighting, and erase her head actually glaring at the boy with his quirk, and... Why is not going off? She thought, then she realized of something really, really bad, guys. She used her quirk on her team, catching their attention. Eraserhead's quirk isn't turning the kid's own, he's immune to it. Huh, was Tiger eloquent reply as he approached the family. It was there that Inko saw how tall the strongest member of the rescue team was, still compared in sizes to a nemesis or a tyrant, held to a death claw, he didn't met them eye to eye, still he was imposing, cat made costume aside, okay never mind the suit, made him more intimidating. Kid, you might want to turn your quirk down. Tiger mentioned, Izuku actually blinked, looking at himself, and then his eyes widened at that. Oh so sorry, I slipped into the storm trance again. Izuku apologized as the electricity around him died in a blink, and he landed softly, 
Tiger still noted that the six, all might size glowing arms remained. Well, they weren't kidding, you are full of surprises, Tiger mentioned again. Indeed, Mandalay called. Eraser had stopped it, it ain't working. This caught Azuka's attention, as he turned to stare at the scraggly looking man, his eyes now red, glowing and his hair levitating. Oh my god, the Erasure hero, Eraser head, how I didn't see it before? Izuku moaned in shock. Because he hates to be recognized, interviewed, and sunlight, Pixie Bob stated with a smirk as she marched to Izuku and poked one of his siren arms, finding it surprisingly solid. Now he hates your quirk, he can't turn it off with his, she added, much to the ire of the Erasure hero. Well, Izuku began, fidgeting. The projector in the Colosseum didn't do it either, and it actually hurt. His quirk really doesn't stack up against the light of the Traveler. Aizawa blinked. Did you just diss my quirk? I think he dissed everyone's. Mandalay replied with a smile. Then again his quirk seems to power on against things that power us off. She added. That's a reason he's here, to train and understand it better. So when the time comes he doesn't end up hurting himself. Mandalay stated. Thank you for having us, Inko said with a smile, bowing to the pussycats, Izuku doing the same. Eri bow like me. The little girl did as told, but made the four members of the rescue team to clutch their chests. She was so damn cute. Dee Dee don't worry about it, Pixie Bob stated. Okay introductions are a go, name's Ryuko Tsuchikawa, but call me the youthful Pixie Bob. But you're 30, Ragdoll stated. I'm 18 at heart. Sigh, just ignore that name Shino Sosaki. I'm the team leader of the wild, wild pussycats. Go by Mandalay in the field. Yawara Kadra is the name. I go by Tiger in the field. I'm waiting to see what you can do, kid. Izuka grinded a little nervously. Of the four pussycats, Tiger was by far the most imposing and frightening, mostly because of his combat prowess. While the rest of the team could fight, Tiger excelled in it capable of fighting as well as rescuing people, all thanks to his quirk, Playa Body, he had seen the videos of Tiger in action. He intimidated as much with his quirk as with his sheer presence alone. And me! Then there was the bundle of energy that seemed to zoom from left to right that honestly made Izuku actually tired by just watching. I'm Ragdoll, just call me Tomoko, or Shiratoko-chan. The green-haired heroine said with a smile as she zoomed around and spun Izuku around as well, making him and by extension his mother and Eri dizzy. Ugh was all Izuku could say as she tried to keep himself from falling. Now that's out of the way, please follow us, Mandalay said, motioning the trio plus underground hero to follow them. Izuku then finally noticed the house, or better said compound and where they were led to. It was three floors high, and rather large compared to an average home. Welcome to our compound. Usually this site doesn't see much activity until May and June, when Yue sends the first years for endurance training. Mandalay stated as she opened the door and led them in. Most of the time, we use it as our private training grounds and recuperation space when a mission gets a little rough. And we want to avoid the press. She added as she shook her head. One bad thing about being a hero, the press, they'll turn anything, and I mean anything, just to get views. Pixie Bob muttered, making Izuka nod. Yeah, I remember the debut of Best Genus, he pulled a flawless rescue and villain apprehension, no collateral damage. The night news were slamming him for being cynical and boring despite the fact his fight was so enthralling to see. Izuka added, making the heroes to look at him. Yeah, remember that one, Genus was this close of suing the channel for slander, especially during the following month, Tiger stated. And I can assume you have seen what they talk about you three. Inko nodded at that with a scowl. Yes, they call my son a sociopath and murderer, they call Eri-chan a detached antisocial child and I was referred to as a warmonger psychopath with inferiority complex, Inko stated. Doesn't help it came of XOF news. Inko said, making Izuka snort. Did you know that XOF is in fact Dash? A parody of Fox News of the United States, back in their heyday before the era of quirks, yes we know. Pixie Bob stated bored. 
I was going to say that XOF is in fact the name of a fictional paramilitary unit that is featured in a game that was really polarizing. It had giant robots, nano zombies, a plot so complicated that only a wiki page could make sense of it, and apparently all of this happened during the Cold War. Giant robots, during the Cold War, Izuka replied, making Pixie Bob blink in shock. What, really? If you want I got the game right here and the entire plot of the series, this was supposed to be the loose end finally tied between two games and timelines, then came Survive, and paying for save game slots, Dark Times, Izuku intoned. Okay, ignoring that, you get my meaning for this place, remote enough for the press itself not to find you, isolated enough that it will take time for anyone to find you, and we are the only people who know the lay of the land. If worse comes to worse we know the place and can defend you effectively, Mandalay stated. Solid plan, but what about reinforcements? Inko asked. Or any other sign of civilization? I doubt you harvest it all. There is a town two hours from here on foot, and a small police station. They are appraised of our presence, but not yours, for security's sake. On car it's fifteen minutes, so we are covered in that regard. Mandalay clarified, making Inko nod. Most importantly, this place is secluded enough for training. Ragdoll shouted with glee. The woods are perfect, natural obstacle course, especially when Pixie lets loose her quirk. The mountain site is perfect for practice of collateral quirks. And we have a hot spring, she added with a grin. When the day's done and you want to rest for the next day, I'll allow us to work on your quirks without much collateral. We saw the video of your fight against that Terminator doll, one of your attacks, that exploding hammer. In a populated sector it could easily start a fire, you need to work on something else. Izuka nodded at Mandalay's reasoning. Well, most of the supers I can use with the light are highly destructive. I can only think of at least three that don't cause main spread destruction. The Night Stalker Bow, the Ward of Dawn and the Well of Dawn. Everything else is fashioned to take down opponents tougher than the wielder, Nova Bombs, Fists of Havoc, Golden Gun, Arc Staff, Dawn Blade, Sentinel Shield, Chaos Reach, Fire Maul, Nova Warp and the Wraith Daggers, name it it's probable it can inflict horrible damage to whatever it's in line of fire. Izuka reasoned. Are all those lethal? Ragdoll wondered. Oh yeah, vaporization atomization or sublimation into ashes i mean arc energy is pretty much electricity on steroids and jet fuel you can imagine how the other two are too that left the pussycats really disturbed then again quirks were pretty much the biological equivalent of handguns but never before they had heard that someone could atomize vaporize and sublimate someone at the same time I need to work on non-lethal versions, maybe combine the Arc Strider agility with the warping ability of Nova Warp and the striking power of a Fist of Havoc, a really watered-down striking force, maybe chain it in multiple taps dash. And Izuka began to mumble a storm. There he goes, Inko replied with a fond smile. Don't mind him, he does that, he'll stop once he finds what he wants, she said with a smile directed to the rescue team. What he mumbles is... Disconcerting, Tiger said, catching up the whim of a sentence that had the words apobiosis and animal strength alongside the words six arms doing it in tandem. If he's going for the non-lethal route, he's failing spectacularly, Pixie Bob stated, missing the look Inko gave her. But I heard some interesting things there, this smoke thing he keeps muttering alongside the lines of glyphs, I'm kinda envious, being able to pretty much craft your own quirk at your taste and needs. Half the world would kill for that ability alone, she added with a smile. Inko simply rolled her eyes. You're not the first hero to mention this, Inko said, seeing her son still in a mumble storm and a world apart his own. Well, it's true, Tiger added. The amount of quirks that are multifunctional are not enough. There are few heroes that can claim this. On the villain's side this is reversed, all thanks to society and their dogmas and warped beliefs. Tiger muttered. Japan has it worse, thanks to the Kappa and, well, our society as a whole. We are more accepting nowadays, but did you know that 200 years ago getting psychological aid was frowned upon? When quirks appeared that thought remained for at least five years, until they realized that quirks were tied to emotions, 
and unstable emotions tied to the equivalent of a biological nuke was a bad idea. The melting of a temple by a teenager that was suffering from anxiety attacks and was close to a mental breakdown proved that. Now psychologists are a must to visit at least a year, just because, and most old timers still frown on those who seek aid. Tiger shook his head. Idiots. Oh, don't I know it. Inko muttered. Her parents never liked psychiatrists, mostly because they might get a clue of what they were doing to her by the way she acted. And once Izuku was born, they actively tried to stop any attempt from her to get Izuku one due to his well status as quirkless before he found the trigger of his quirk. Made her wonder what were they thinking now, that her son was not as quirkless and defenseless as they expected him to be but rather the equivalent of a cute dog that suddenly turns into a dragon and breathes napalm and shoots lasers from his eyes. Heck it made her wonder period what were they thinking now. What other ploy were they hatching to get her son and raise him as a proper boy, which meant turn him into a puppet and trophy husband to use for their machinations and boost their status. Well, in here you three will be able to train at your fullest. Mandalay stated as they stopped in front of a door. This caught the attention of Inko. Us? I thought Izukaku needed the training, you know, because his quirk power? Inko wondered. Mandalay looked conflicted at this. True, to an extent, your son's quirk, while powerful, seems to be evolving at a speed no one had seen before. Mandalay commented. The problem is you too. She added, pointing at Inko and Eri. That projector, whatever it was supposed to suppress did something else, seemed to have affected your quirks. In the case of the little one, we don't know what she can do, so most of the month will be spent on figuring what she can do and ensuring that there are no incidents regarding her quirk activation. Mandalay stated, Eri on the sidelines seemed to stiffen at the idea of using her quirk. That's the reason grumpiness incarnate here was sent. Aside from extra protection and a lesson, his quirk worked best for nullification of other quirks, aside your son's own, but you get the gist of it, also it helps he is a teacher of UA. Izuku whipped his head to the direction of Aizawa upon hearing that. So if there is someone that can teach the little one how to control her quirk, if it needs control is him. Aizawa by his part looked annoyed that Pixie Bob ousted him in such a way. We will see how this develops. First we need to know if she can manifest her own, then we work form there," Aizawa replied. As for Midoriya, as long he shows potential, we'll see. Inko looked irritated at this. You're showing the potential of waking up with a broken arm. She snapped, making Izuka look at her in panic. Mom! You can't just threaten a hero just like that! Izuka exclaimed, yet his voice didn't raise more than a whisper. Aizawa noted that despite that, his voice sounded like a full-blown, indignant shout. If he can't see potential, then he has wasted potential himself. Was Inko crude reply. In all honesty, she was very fed up with people doubting her son, and considering all the bullying her son endured, it was high time someone lashed out. The fact her son didn't lash out of the goodness of his heart, when he should was testament out of good he was. She, on the other hand, wasn't so nice with people that bullied her family. The fact she didn't chew Katsuki's head off, literally, was testament enough of her patience. But everything has a limit, and she reached hers. Oh ho 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 preach, sister! Pixie Bob clamored. I get the feeling we'll get along just fine. The blue-themed heroine said with a grin, all while Aizawa was trying to process what was told to him. Uh, I'm so sorry. Izuku apologized to Mandalay who just waved it off. Don't sweat it. Aizawa-san had his own share of flack thrown at him for what he has done in UA. Mandalay began, making Izuku go bug-eyed. He has high standards on what a hero should be and perform. You mean so high he's pretty much stuck in his own dash. Pixie Bob! Keep it PG! Mandalay barked, sighing as her teammate and friend pouted, but then smirked. Still didn't save him from that woman, remember that mop head? Pixie Bob teased Aizawa, who looked ready to murder her. I don't recall anything of the sort. Because she knocked you the EFF out. She laughed. She clocked you so hard you spun three times on the air and hit the ground face first. Vlad King was laughing his ass off. And so was I. 
Ah, uh, did something happen between them? Izuku risked the question, looking rather uncomfortable, just like Eri was at the current conversation. Tiger risked the answer. They were together, and they broke up, rather messily. That bad? Izuku mouthed, the equivalent of a whisper with his enhanced vocal cords. Tiger nodded while making a cringe face. It had been, not a good time for Pixie, or ice cream, or the cliff that used to be nearby. It wasn't long, thankfully, to reach a set of doors, okay, Mandalay said, opening the door and ushering the Midoriya's plus Airy inside. The room was rather spacious. There was a TV set and two beds, one bigger than the other. Surely for Inko and Airy to sleep together, Izuku wouldn't mind sleeping on the floor as long Inko and Airy could sleep comfortably. There was also a fake wall separating the room, or at the very least separating the beds, to give some sense of privacy to the occupants. This will be your room, Mandalay called, allowing the trio to get in. There's a TV set as requested by you. We have a spare computer that's disconnected of the internet. Clever thinking by you, by the way. Mandalay praised Izuku who blushed at that. Little people tended to praise him, and a heroine just did. This was a good day. When you guys are ready we can start talking about a schedule and perhaps a more accurate description of your quirk Midoriyakuen, and maybe brainstorm for some names, you really need to name it. Mandalay stated as she left the trio to unpack. The Midoriyas smiled, Izuku dropping the bags and starting to unpack, Eri helping up as best she could as Inko folded the clothes and started to set in, preparing for what lay ahead. For the Pussycats and the Erasure Hero, they had another thing to do once they arrived to the living room. Okay, first off, Pixie Eraserhead, I know you two had a messy breakup and don't even start I am talking and you will listen, even if I have to broadcast myself into your heads. Mandalay snapped, making both to keep their mouths shut. They knew that Mandalay was not to be crossed when she was like this. But I want you two to keep it professional, okay? No snark, no bite. No sudden quirk cancellation or so God help me I'll shove my feet up both your asses and wear you as sandals, am I understood? Pixie Bob nodded, knowing that this would happen when it was informed that Aizawa was going to be the extra security detail for the Midoriyas and Little Airy. Aizawa for his part grunted, this didn't satisfy Mandalay. I mean it eraser head, I am not in the mood for your bullshit, I have already enough on my plate with the Midoriyas and the troop, not to mention, sis. Aizawa's gaze softened. He and every hero knew damn well what the pussycats were dealing with. The death of their sister team, the water hose, especially Mandalay with the death of her sister and her brother-in-law, leaving an orphan behind after their deaths at the hands of the villain and battle maniac Muscular. The aftermath was still felt, even after five months of their deaths. The fact a criminal as dangerous as Muscular was willing to massacre an entire village just to get some excitement on his life told them pretty much the level of insanity real villains had, the level of callousness they had for human life, but also set a dangerous precedent. Heroes die, they are human too, but most of the time it was because of a mistake they make on the field, most of the times not even the villains had a hand on their deaths. It was a shocking statistic but heroes died far more during rescue operations rather than combat. Mostly because they weren't trained for rescue and didn't know the procedures, tended to wander into dangerous terrain, and there their quirks didn't help them. This was a statistic shared among the newer generation, the water hose, the pussycats, 13, all might, endeavor and eraser had belonged to a generation that saw a rise of true villains, not the current villains, but true, evil, callous, cold-blooded killers whose plans tended to cause severe loss of human life. The current generation had villains but these ones would rather steal a purse and do it in silence than tangle with a far better trained hero. How most of the time they fought out of desperation, it was hard to find villains that had tangled with heroes and had escaped their fights. It was harder still to find villains of the caliber of muscular, yet it happened and the water hose had paid the price of that sloppy mistake they should had corrected years ago. Muscular was wanted on several prefectures. Murder was his most predominant crime. The water hose team were not his first hero victims, but they shouldn't have been his victims at all if they had done their jobs. Had organized a team and hunted him down like the rabid animal he is. 
for fuck's sakes Endeavor might not have all might unnatural super strength, but he shoots fire hot enough to sublimate muscle. Muscular would be well cooked and on his way to Tartarus if someone in the HPSC hadn't been dragging their fucking knuckles like a under-evolved gorilla. I'll try my best, but don't expect miracles, problem child seems to have a penchant for problems. Aizawa replied. You do realize he had his quirk active for just a month, right? Be thankful he just attracts problems and he's not drunk with power. Tiger snapped. I'm more worried about the little girl, Eri. She seemed scared on the prospect of using her quirk. The giant pussycat stated with a frown. Probably trauma, Aizawa stated. Trauma? You see the pictures of her arms? Aizawa shook his head at Ragdoll's question. Oh, of course, you were punished, sorry. Long story short, her arms are a collection of scars that frankly make me want to claw the eyes of the guy who did them, slowly, painfully, then make him eat them. Alongside his balls, Ragdoll explained in a rather somber tone. Aizawa just blinked at the tone the usually cheery woman said things, right? He shook his head. In any case, we must be careful. We don't know what she can truly do. Pixie Bob, you will build a pair of walls at her sides to funnel her quirk activation if it goes violent, in one single direction. I'll stay behind to erase her quirk if anything goes wrong, Aizawa stated. The files we got state that Midoriyakuen has some similar abilities that can nullify quirks, but wish to test them first before anything else. If yours fail, we can fall back onto his. So Eri's first quirk activation will have to wait at least two days until we know what he's truly capable of. Okay. The group nodded at Mandalay's reasoning. Excuse me, he can what? Pixie Bob wondered out loud. I get he has enough firepower to level an entire city block so he wishes. I mean he mentioned atomization as a side effect of one of his attacks. But having the ability to also cancel quirks. That's a fucking gold mine, Pixie Bob stated. But I get the fact he wants to see if it works as well as he claims, which begs the question, what the hell is his quirk? I can tell you. Pixie Bob jumped from her seat and into Ragdoll's lap in sheer fright, looking around to the source of the voice and seeing, was that the purple outline of a boy? Then the outline poofed slightly and Izuku was there, actually grinning. Partial invisibility, work better on shadows and dark nights, hunters are cheap and cheat, but you can't deny they have the best tricks. He commented as he looked at the assembled pros. Aizawa was the first to speak. You can turn invisible? Partial, Izuku commented. It's all part of the Night Stalker Ensemble. Hit fast, hit hard and be alive to tell the tale. Izuku said. Well, Pixie Bob said as she dislodged herself of Ragdoll. Don't do that again. Like really don't do it again. Nearly had a heart attack. And since when you been here? Uh, about ten seconds. Wanted to surprise you all. Been practicing with the void since we left Muzutafu. I'm getting a better handling of it now. He said with a small smile. It's really hard you know, the void. It's not like the feeling of arc energy discharging at once. Or the feeling of solar energy being let out at bursts. It's there. But you have to embrace the void to understand the void. Be calm in the void. I understood literally nothing of what you said. Pixie Bob began. Maybe if we knew what you can do, maybe all that fortune cookie spiel would make some sense. She added. Izuka simply took a deep breath, rolling around the balls of his feet. Okay, just keep an open mind. He said as he went to one of the seats nearby and sat down. It can't be that bad. Tiger muttered. It's a gamer quirk. Izuka simply dropped the bomb down. Bullshit, Pixie Bob remarked. There are no gamer quirks in Japan. Only China and Korea have them. Also no gamer quirk can do what you do. They add perks and enough numbers to drive any mathematician to a mental meltdown. They don't make someone able to become invisible and handle supernatural forces beyond our comprehension. Pixie Bob argued. Show what you know about them. Izuka reposted. Gamer quirks. Like the name implies, take elements of games, RPGs, fighting, racing, first-person shooters. True, they all so far have one common denominator. A HUD and a status screen filled with numbers and stats. Mine doesn't. Izuka clarified. My quirk pretty much does the opposite. 
instead of a constant grind, my quirk allows me to take the powers and special abilities of the characters I play as, as long as I meet the parameters and use them for myself, no numbers, no HUD, there is training, but that's the critical difference between gamer quirks and mine, Izuka said. Silence fell on the living room once he explained this, for the pros this was a new development, never before a gamer quirk had changed in such a radical way. It explained why he was so powerful. He could literally cherry-pick his power from a vast selection of overpowered characters and make them his own. There is a but in there, is it? Aizawa asked, more focused than before. Yes, to begin I cannot gain powers of characters who stared first on books of any kind, comic books, mangas, reading books. I tested it with Superman games and The Witcher games, my quirk short-circuited. Also, I don't know about characters that may have started in movies or TV series. I am planning to test that with a Star Wars game I have. Those characters and powers must have begun their lives in a video game. I think there is a loophole, so I'm testing it today. The second rule is difficulty. I have to complete the game I am playing in its hardest mode. Also, I have to beat the game. Duh. If the game doesn't have a difficulty, then there is the third rule. Completion rate. I have to beat the game in its hardest mode and with a completion rate of either 95 to a 100 then there is rule 4. I cannot get powers that depend on an object in its entirety. Many think the guardians depend on their ghosts to use their light. But guardians are infused with the light. Ghosts are therefore one of their most broken abilities. Resurrection. I don't have a ghost so I can't be resurrected. But I can do everything else, like you saw because I have a connection to fundamental forces in the universe now thanks to my quirk. Why I whisper? My voice is so powerful that raising it will make the room shake. This is an after effect of gaining the Thursday um, which in dragon means shout, and the character who I played as could use it naturally, no objects involved in it activation. Well he sucked the soul of a dragon but since I know how to shout and its meanings I bypass that step entirely. See what I mean, my quirk is so powerful because of its complicated set of rules I have to abide to. Izuka stated firmly. So Mandalay began. A copy quirk that behaves like a gamer quirk. She summarized. Uh, try a copy and store quirk. A month has passed since I gained the Thursday um. It hasn't lost its potency or felt. Diminished. I think it's permanent. Izuka corrected, making Mandalay blink. But I must have a limit, I can't just continue copying powers without stopping. There must be a limit of how much I can gain before it becomes too much for my body. Izuka concluded. Indeed, Tiger stated. But that's the work of the doctors. We are here to ensure you're better prepared for combat. You know what you're getting and how can they be applied. But one thing is theory, other is the situation in question. First of all, what you got? What are you planning to add? So we can work around those, Tiger suggested. Well, Izuka put his hand on his chin. My first power is the Thursday um, or shout, I'll spare you the lore. But in a nutshell, I can shout either flames, ice, freeze someone solid. Among other things, each shout has three words of power. Each word adds power to the shout. Unrelenting force, for example. Fuss, row and da, force, balance and push. I got at least a dozen shouts in my arsenal with three really capable of messing someone really bad and one I haven't tested because, well, it was designed to attack dragons and make them realize the concept of mortality, something dragons cannot comprehend because they are kinda immortal. The pussycats and Aizawa blinked at that. That's his first power? Was their collective thought. It was incredibly broken, but they could see some glaring weaknesses, like being too offensive, and of course being something he telegraphs without wanting. After all, he is shouting them. Then it's blade mode, Izuka said. The name throws what it can do. With it, I can slow my perception of time at half and increase my reaction speed. It goes to 90 if I do it after a parry, but it depends on adrenaline. So I use it on short bursts to not burn myself down and be left lightheaded. Again, a broken power, but with a factual weakness and an incredible redeeming quality. Being able to react faster than your opponent and even being able to react to their attacks. Aizawa would kill for a skill like that, and the kid had it as his second power, showing him that maybe there was a brain behind that mush of green hair. The third one, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I got it by accident. And the feeling of pride for the kid went out the window. 
I didn't check the difficulty, and I was kinda stressed, so... Izuka said as he lifted his left sleeve and showed the heroes the intricate blue glowing tattoos that covered his left arm. It's not just my arm, my entire left side it's covered in alien tattoos. This is the sign of a siren, a female warrior that can kill with their brains, metaphorically and literally. The one I got is called Phase Trance. You saw it in action, the six arms. I can call them forth to unleash a melee of brutal attacks, or shoot them like missiles or slam one into the ground and make it burst under my opponent to create a stasis field around them, or leap into the air and shoot lasers down, and slam down after, and I can imbue them with elemental properties, right there's where the light comes in. There's more! Was their collective thought, it was scary. With those three powers he was a fearsome melee combatant, one of care, if he didn't shout you to a wall, he could punch you into one, or one of his six arms would clip you, he gave no particular avenue to dodge his limbs, he can shoot them like missiles. There are very few people in the world that can claim they can launch their arms as rockets, and apparently he can put someone in stasis and shoot lasers. Lasers. The light of the traveler is complicated, it's a power casual force. Right now I'm outside the laws of cause and effect, I think, maybe. As a result of this I can wield the three spectrums of light associated to guardians, Beings that are infused with the light to fight the darkness. Another park casual force, solar. Which is derived from the energies produced by quantum forces, arc. Which derive from the forces that binds complex matter and void. Which is a derivative from the dark energy of the vacuum beneath matter. With it I can do a lot of things. I am stronger because of it. A little tougher. I can break most natural laws of physics. Like double jumping in midair. I can infuse my melee attacks to cause a number of status, and when I want to get serious I unleash it all in what it is called supers, me going invisible. Just an example of what I can do with the light. The heroes remained silent, mostly mulling on what they had learned, the fourth power. Easily something that warranted immediate study, as in ship him to island, with a full hero contingent, he was breaking several laws of pretty much everything by simply existing and they were supposed to train him, to be prepared against the troop. He was more than ready. He was right now the most dangerous 14-year-old alive. Calm down, Aizawa chided himself. Tiger said it itself, he's here to train and ensure he's ready. The kid blitz troop creatures out of anger, not strategy. He needs the training, and he knows it. He wouldn't be sharing this if he didn't knew this. Aizawa reminded himself, it was simply logic, the kid was smart. Smart enough to recognize that even with this overwhelming power he was just a child, and the troop had enough troops to wither him down if he wasn't careful. You have ideas to add more, right? Ragdoll dared ask. Izuka simply smiled a smile that made any fears of him becoming a megalomaniac drunk with power dash away into the ether. Oh, do I have some ideas? Izuka glee was palpable. I got enough firepower and I have some ways to heal and defend the ward and Well of Dawn are perfect for it, and the Sentinel Shield it's the perfect mobile barricade for police officers to rally into and lay suppressing fire, but I need something more personal and less, area of effect. So Parasite Eve 2 it's the answer. I don't trust anything that has the words Parasite by simple reason, Ragdoll muttered. Understandable, but needed, the troop somehow made the monster of Parasite Eve a reality. At least the strangers as far as I know, but I don't want to risk it. I already have enough knowing they somehow made a functional nemesis and liquors. I really don't want to find out if they made something akin to the ultimate being. Izuku explained. You're talking in an alien language we can't understand. Pixie Bob teased. Speak for yourself. Tiger and Aizawa stated at the same time. Mandalay sighed, but then focused once more. Okay, Midoriya, new powers, how long they will take? How destructive? Go, she ordered. Okay, parasite energy, it's more personal. It will use my very mitochondria and supercharge it. I'll be able to use powers based on the four elements. Fire will be ultra-offensive attacks, while wind-based powers are all about status effect. Water, it's all about healing and earth on pure defense and buffs. Like I said, very personal. The most destructive attack I can think of is Inferno, 
which is described as using radioactive isotopes to set off a nuclear fission on a very small scale. Izuku explained. There was silence again. You can what? Izuku sighed, this might take a while. She couldn't feel her legs. Neural composition at 20%. Her arms, why her arms felt sluggish. Epidermis structural integrity at 25%. It was dark, why everything was so dark. Endoskeleton structural integrity at 10%. Fire, fire, fire. Removal of cerebral casing imin. Why it's so dark. Re-establishing system functions. Limbs, not found. Weapons, not found. Endoskeleton, not found. Neural composition, not found. Starting search of network, loading. Local network not found. Home station link found, linking. Visuals at 180 by 180 pixelated. The first thing M98 saw was the blank face of Omega. Ah, uh, M98, welcome back. I failed. You did, yet you succeeded, Omega stated. I am a wreck. Cannot deny that you barely survived an encounter with a now categorized K0. Izuka Midoriya has become more than a pebble in our shoes, more than a thorn in our sides. He is a sword firmly placed at our side, and we have no way so far to parry the death blow that will come. Omega explained, looking at M98, or what remained of the T doll. Uh, K0, he ain't that much, I could have killed him. If he had been in his five senses, no. He fought you with a broken leg, high on psychotropics that should had killed him on the spot, and he survived nonetheless. No, you were lucky he was crippled, otherwise you would be dead and we would not have valuable data to use against him. Omega explained. M98 just remained silent. What it's to become of me? M98 asked, knowing full well the fate most tea dolls like her tended to share once a mission failed in the fashion hers did especially with the catastrophic damage to her body. I am no the founder. I am not going to have you erased. You are an asset that survived a case zero. No other T-Doll can boast that. Every other T-Doll that has gone against All Might has been destroyed. You survived the closest thing to it. M98 understood case zero was a special assignation to targets that needed to be killed, but were so powerful by any reason that T-Dolls or any Bao send their way was expected to die in the accomplishment of their mission. There was no other way of saying it. It was a suicide mission. There was also the small detail that Case Zero characters were usually one of a kind. There hasn't been someone like All Might, his unnatural. Well, everything made him something of a T-Doll killer. He had over 50 confirmed kills, 50 dolls send against him, none returned not to mention the number of bows he has dispatched with one punch. The energies Izuka Midori emitted and his plethora of abilities that range from the ridiculous to the are you serious? Surely qualified him for a case zero termination notice. The fact her masters believed him to be a threat enough to warrant a case zero qualification meant that upon death, his body would be cut, harvested and studied to discover how he had done it, how he was able to stand against her and wreck her, destroy her. I understand, what is to become of me? M98 asked again. Omega held his gaze on her for a moment, then looked to the side. There M98 finally saw where she was. A lab, one of the many labs they had in the base. This was a special one of course, it was empty. Three computer towers were interconnected, used to filter and sort memories to then apply for tactical for other Terminator dolls. It is usually dark, and no one enters until the operation is finished. The neural cores of the dolls are removed usually to do this, and they are off as well, to prevent tampering of any kind. Now she knew why she couldn't access anything. She was right now, just an oval compartment that housed her neural core and hooked to the computers, which at any minute, once she is turned off, will start to sort through her memories and battle data for meaningful data to be used. Once the sorting is complete, Omega began. Your core will be placed in a beta body we have been experimenting with. We will test it to its fullest. Once the tests are completed, we will place you in an improved body and continue your duties. Omega said. I see. 
was all M98 replied. Don't be sad, you'll be helping us in the long run. After all I-44, I-45 and I-46 will deal with the Midorias, Omega said as he prepared to leave. And if they can't? M98 asked, making Omega stop. What if they fail? Then, Omega said slowly. We do it again, and again and again, until he dies, until his mother dies and until the little girl dies, Omega said. We are infinite legion, an army no hero can hope to stand against, no villain can hope to comprehend. We will reshape this world, or burn it and build from the ashes, now shut down. M98 did as told. Her system shutting down, but letting them accessible to the computers. Darkness overtook M98. The computers didn't caught on. But her first three seconds of inactivity after their conversation were nightmares, and would continue to be nightmares. Nightmares the computers would not be able to record or register, or anyone would be able to find out unless they were looking for them. By that time, it would be too late. So, that's about what I'm planning to add while I'm here, Izuka said cheerfully, but there was some shyness interlaced with his tone. After all, he just talked with several pros about his quirk, more so about his plans and what he wanted to become in terms of a hero. For the heroes in question, however, He's fucking insane, was the collective thought of the pussycats, one that was echoed once Mandalay echoed the same words on their minds, but thankfully not on Izuka's mind. The description of the powers he gained was, okay-ish, it broke several laws of, well just about everything they held dear when it came to quirks and fundamental laws of reality. It was once he started to explain their origins and from who character they came from, they began to grow worried. The Thursday um came of a character that most of the time was silent, and whose morality was grey as hell. Despite ending a war he also made covenants with what could be called demons and was either a thief, an assassin, a necromancer or all three all while sucking the souls of dragons like if it was spaghetti. They were glad he couldn't do that. Then there was Blade Mode, belonging to a character that was, as complicated as the plot of the game he belonged, and was used to chop enemies down. And he wasn't joking on that part, one could apparently chop enemies into literal ribbons and take their, what could be assumed was their organs to refuel. The fact that every enemy was either a cyborg or a robot didn't help in the least. The siren powers belonged to a battle-happy woman that lived in a universe that at best was filled with jackasses and at worst with cannibal assholes with delusions of godhood. Oh, and the psychotic bandits that quoted Shakespeare works while on bloody rampages and getting shot in the face with shotguns, while the main characters laughed. The fourth was, okay, if you ignored the background of the Guardians or their universe and enemies in general, the Hive was, just, ugh, and the origins of Guardians before they were Guardians, when they were warlords reminded the heroes of their own origins, as every single hero owed their existence to the vigilantes of old. Although the media and companies worldwide wanted everyone to forget there were vigilantes before heroes. Ignoring all that, the very problem of his quirk was the image that it was going to portray of him. Heroes rarely cared about a person's quirk unless a, it is causing massive collateral damage or b, it's driving them insane. It was rare but quirk insanity existed. But most of the time they didn't care if the quirk made them villainous Mandalay would need her own assistant to keep up the number of times she met villains that had really useful quirks that could had saved lives, and from that stemmed the real problem. Society itself, in a world that has seen flashy quirks used by heroes and really disturbing quirks used by villains, society in general had created its own opinions. This in turn had ostracized people that could have saved so many lives. Individuals are accepting and smart, the mass is dumb and afraid. And that has led to tragedies that could have been avoided. There was also the government, but they are the government, and when they fuck up they try to brush it under the rug, it never works. The mess with Destro could have been avoided if the Japanese diet had kept their damn mouths shut. That and stop taunting the guy with an army. In Izuku's case, it was twofold. First was the nature of his quirk. There was a stigma with copy quirks, and his would bring the worse, as the things he copied would be permanent, as it appeared, tests would corroborate his assumptions, but overall it seemed to be a permanent thing, most copy quirk copied quirks with a limited time span. 
The more simples required a simple touch and lasted minutes, the more complicated could last hours. Izuku's quirk was the most complicated version she had seen so far, requiring time, dedication and an actual schedule and specific objects to attain it, it explained why the powers still remained even after a month of getting them. Then there was the second nature of the quirk, a stockpile quirk, it was an unknown, civilians didn't like unknowns, and many assumed that the quirk of the kappa was part stockpile, further enhancing the stigma on a quirk that might have stockpile as its base. Izuku seemed not to care and not know, or know and actually not care. Whatever the case he was dead set on his goal, apparently he was done with the world telling him you can't and decided to answer back with a stop me if you can declaration. Okay, Mandalay spoke, bringing the attention to her. Those three powers you want to add, how long you think you can get them? She wondered. Well, Izuku began. Parasite Eve 2, I'm just two bosses away of the ending. I'm armed, ready and everything, but it's nightmare mode, that mode it's infamous for being brutal, tank controls and laggy reaction from control to character makes it worse against the final boss that just loves to become a living projectile, I reckon an hour at worst. 15 minutes if I go all out, I have the magnum and my ed rounds, that gun can eat trough bosses like you can't imagine, Izuka said with a nod. The other two, the second I'm halfway through the game. I give it a week depending of the training, I'm planning a 2 to 3 hour session of gaming daily, the last one, that one's different, the game's not hard, I beat it before on normal mode, never dared with hard mode because it was, boring. The real time consumer will be the number of characters, this is a fighting game, multiple characters, not one main character, multiple, I am worried how my quirk will react to it. Izuka stated, probably, I'll take me another week. So one week of training, one of gaming, another of training and another of gaming. Then the rest of time to adapt and prepare. Izuka stated. Maybe less, maybe more, but that's about it. There was silence on the room, the pros mulling on what was said to them. It was Aizawa who broke the silence. This schedule, are you certain you can keep with it? He asked. This will be taxing. This will not be the Colosseum. Can you keep up? He asked again. I have to, others had ten years to get used to their quirks. Izuka confessed, then chuckled. Then again, for someone who had his quirk active for one month, I have done well. Besides, I have something they don't. Izuka said, pulling a book from the back of his pants, and showing it. I got a guide, he said. I know what I want to be. I want to be a hero that can inspire with a smile. I want to excel. I want to be the best me I can be. Izuka stated not noting the way Aizawa was smiling. Good, was all Aizawa said, internally pleased. Finally, someone who dared, a small glance to the pussycats told him that they were thinking the same. Then we start now, Mandalay replied, standing up. You haven't tested your light fully, right? Izuka nodded. Then let's start. The meeting has gone as well as one could expect, which considering the nature of the meeting in on itself, in all honesty had it been the Diet who called the meeting instead of any one of the Hero Association, the meeting would still be going. Don't get him wrong, the Diet was integral part of Japan's very own government structure. But the fact remained, they were part of an era when Japan sought to avoid conflict as much as possible, a sad reminder of how they were cowed into submission by the destruction of two cities to finally stop. But in the current superhuman era, conflict was simply unavoidable. Japan, a country that could easily boast having the least amount of conflict of any kind before the Quirk era, was now part of the rest of the world when it came to hero slash villain fight and criminality. Quirks had, for the lack of better words, escalated the conflict of order versus chaos, and in those instances, the heavy bureaucracy of the Japanese diet would simply not do. Everyone knew that, even the members of the diet, didn't stop them to try thought which meant that sometimes they had to be set aside, like setting kids aside and telling them to go play somewhere else, which of course angered them. There was a reason every hero's school only had a limit of 20 students. When originally it had been 30, the diet had meddled and ensured that the limit was 20, no more. It had been a spiteful move on their part, 
One the heroes retaliated in kind with several political maneuvers that left those who supported and understood how complex the hero job had gotten and allowed them a certain leeway that they didn't enjoy before. There was a reason they hadn't raised hell with a meeting that clearly lacked the governmental protocol most meetings of the Diet with a high-ranking politician tended to have, in this instance, the Emperor, but things had escalated to such a degree that tying oneself to protocol was a bad idea. Especially when their enemy tended to use this as an advantage. The second part of their meeting, focusing on the troop operations and how to counter them had been productive, the raid of the Colosseum had provided more than captures several serves with locations of minor troop sites all across Japan, and hinting at a main base somewhere in the country. Their nerve center a place where the leadership heading the operations in Japan was. If they could find it and capture its leaders there, it would be a severe blow to the troop operations in Japan and possibly all across Asia, who pretty much protected their leaders as they protected their secrets, with zealous jealousy. Never before something like that has occurred, they struck minor sites and captures grunts and scientists, destroyed Tidal's plants and bow containers, but never before a government had been close enough to attack their main bases and capture their leaders, crippling their morale and effectiveness. As far as he knew, there were rumors the Americans had been very close to do that, but then their new president came and well, he was an incompetent that ruined everything he touched. It was a productive meeting, Naitai stated from his side looking somewhat between perplexed and pleased. So rare, appreciate this Yagi, we might not get the same kind of results in future meetings, Naitai stated. You just say that because you never had dealt with a meeting full of politicians I have, Yagi reminded. But you're right, these are rare, we got progress, above all, we have a plan. The symbol of peace, in disguise, stated with a grin. After fifty years, the troop will finally know what it feels to be on the receiving end. He stated with a small smile, one that turned into a frown. The number of victims of the actions of the troop were, unaccounted for, from vagabonds that would not be missed to children that were still looked by their families, to families, to military companies and entire passengers of airplanes. The world hasn't had this kind of terrorists since the past two centuries, and their actions were abhorrent as well. To be perfectly honest the only reason they troop hasn't taken over and had started their purge of quirks and a technocracy that honestly sounded way too close to the Imperium of Man. But ignoring the Emperor of Mankind and becoming instant assholes was because of the heroes, police officers, civilians and any military officer that dared to fight them, delaying their plans over and over, but the price had been too high. To be able to finally strike back at them, to bleed them, and then finally take them down, even if it was on their country would be a rise on the morale of everyone that led the fight against the troop. Everyone expected All Might to one day destroy them casually, only a few knew that his time was growing oh so ever short, it had been the stubbornness of Mirio and Night Eye that kept him from actually going and burning his three hour limit while trying to stop every single crime that he came across. It was them that reminded him that there were other heroes that could handle the situation well enough and should save his strength to bigger threats. He countered that each day the public didn't see the symbol of peace was a day villains would take as advantage of. A compromise was reached, a day of heroing, another of rest, actual rest, then rinse a repeat, to allow his body to rest, at the very least allow his old wound to somehow heal, at least, according to Naitai, Yagi had to accept as it seemed the plan Naitai placed did had some benefits. And it would allow them to prepare them for the eventual Yakuza raid. So far just intelligence gathering, while Eri had been helpful to decipher the quirk of overhaul, she had little luck with the others. At the least they had the suspicious with two, one apparently could make you speak the truth, as Eri told them that she felt compelled to say things that normally she would not. The other apparently drank and then one would feel dizzy, as if the world was moving left and right up and down without a regard. The other they assumed was purely combat-based or defensive as she never saw them in action, but considering that overhaul was the one that tended to chase Eri, it stood to reason she knew more about his quirk than anyone else. Any ideas where to start this purge of the troop? Night I questioned, looking ahead, 
The original idea had been to start coordinated assaults on their minor hubs and capture their higher operatives and any serves they may have so they can key the location of their main base. That line of thought died the moment the name of Durara Honda came to the discussion. His house had been raided a day before. The computer there seized and searched for any kind of information. There was many. Ten years' worth of his mistakes proven to be in fact a troop ploy to hinder the police and hero forces. So when the eventual takeover happens, they can't fight back as effectively as they do now. Obviously that was stopped thanks to Chief Mineta and his predecessor purges on corrupt agents that worked with Honda. But one file clued that Honda had more agents, not just in the police, but within political ranks and even villains. There was suspicious that his father might be aligned with the troop, but no evidence was found in the computer, and his brother wasn't talking either, also because he had no teeth and his jaw was caved, you can thank Inko Midoriya for that. But there were suspicious that the Honda family in general was part of the troop, B and her lackeys weren't talking either, their lawyers were sketchy as hell and kept throwing every single law and counter-argument to prevent their clients from talking. That was the reason of a coordinated assault on the same day. Stretching their numbers was a no-go. There was a huge possibility that something could go wrong. So a plan was devised. Three bases were selected at random. They would be struck and their occupants captured. Meanwhile, the remaining bases would be scouted and watched in case they tried something crazy, which they would... Any time a base would try anything they would strike that base with impunity, all while other two bases chosen at random would be attacked as well, and they would repeat the cycle over and over. It would look at random at first, but it was anything but random. It was meant to sow disarray and chaos within their ranks, to ensure they weren't ready for attacks of any kind and ensure that if they had moles in their ranks, they would not be able to relay information effectively, and if they do somehow, they can weed them out as just a selected number of people would know which would be the targets of the attacks, slowly taking out their moles with a somewhat accurate capability. As a matter of fact, I do, Yagi stated, looking at his former sidekick, and hopefully still his friend. Musutifu has been their home for far too long. Let's send them an eviction notice. Mandalay had seen a good share of destructive quirks, weird quirks, and overall over-the-top quirks. Izuku's quirk easily topped everything she had seen so far. From the ability to channel electricity that seemed far more pure and more powerful than standard, to fire that burned so hot and to a molecular level to the very ability to take what she could safely say was dark energy and manipulated it with ease was something of a very destructive quirk that would made him noticeable in the hero world. Then she had to remind herself that he had more than that as six arms, now purple, rendered the bedrock to an atomic level with a barrage of punches that can easily kill if he doesn't control their output. It didn't bother her as much as it should for some reason. Maybe it was because of the explanation before, so she knew what to expect of what he could do, what his powers could do. Still couldn't prepare her, or anyone for that matter on its destructive power. Son, tone it down. Mandalay heard Inko call her son. Immediately Izuka began to tone down the destructive power of his void Ashura as he called it out on a whim. It kinda fit the motif of the name, a relentless striker that could tear the defenses that anything it attacked. There was no reliable defense against six arms that struck with enough force to break rocks with ease, or better said, rend the atoms of the rocks with ease, against a living being that's pretty much a recipe for untold agony. We have to train more restraint on him. Mandalay transmitted to her team and Aizawa who nodded in return, while she knew for a fact that the kid seemed to know that a hero doesn't kill and restrains himself as he knew them and their actions, and tried, really tried to tone his power output down. There was the reality that he had to really let loose against the troop and its forces, that alone could teach him some really bad habits, like using excessive force when it was not needed. This was the reason the Midoriyas had been sent to them, Aside the remote location only a handful of people knew, it was to train control into Izuku and Eri, especially Eri, a little child who probably didn't know the meaning of the word, and also stabbed a lot of bows and the principal of Izuku's former school with her horn. She needed the training the most, who knows what kind of quirk she has and how dangerous can be. Okay, Mandalay called, 
Seeing Izuku strike the rock wall with restraint, it still amazed her that he hadn't cracked his hands against the rock, instead he had cracked the rocks. Time to see that power you say can possibly cancel quirks, then we move to Eri-chan. So mentioned girl gulped, she obviously wasn't too thrilled with the idea of using her quirk. Izuka nodded. I might need a volunteer for this, don't worry I won't hit that person, the shadow shot it's better for crowd control. Izuka began. I just need to see if it can suppress quirks and muddle movement as the game version. He added. Okay, I'll do it. Pixie Bob offered, stepping to Izuka's side. So, you already showed us almost everything this one comes from? The Night Stalker, Izuka answered, letting the void flow to him. Then he jumped, his left arm shot forward, and in his hand a bow of actual energy formed. Then he reached with his right hand and began to pull, energy forming from where he was tensing the string of energy. Then he let it loose. A single purple bolt that resembled an arrow flew onward, striking the ground and embedding itself, then it began to form into a ball of energy. Okay Pixie Bob, just step close enough, then try to activate your quirk. Izuka said the youthful member of the team nodded, walking with some swagger at the ball of pure energy that swirled with the promise of something hidden that should not be messed with. Close enough a single thread of energy shot to her and latched into her form. Instantly she felt woozy, her legs felt boneless and her muscles felt lacking. To be honest, she felt like everything of her felt lacking. Ugh, this feels weird, she admitted. Please use your quirk, Izuka asked. I don't think I can even walk straight, she bemoaned. Just try it, ma'am, Izuka begged. Pixie Bob bit her lips and put an effort Kneeling down she slammed her hands on the ground. Nothing. Not even a glow of activation. Pixie Bob tried again, and again, and again. The result was the same. Her quirk was not answering to her. After 30 seconds, the shad shot lost its energy charge and died out. Pixie Bob let out a gasp as her body began to answer the way she did, and she activated her quirk to see if it worked. A small dog made out of rocks was the answer to that just like she intended. Yeah, that thing suppresses all right, and disorients, she admitted. You're going to be a mob's worst nightmare, Pixie admitted. Does this distinguish between friend from foe? Let's find out. Okay, Pixie will be friend. Who is the foe? I will, Tiger stepped on. With a nod, Azuku again fired another shadow shot, the bolt of pure void embedding into the ground between Tiger and Pixie Bob. The string of void light attached itself to Tiger, ignoring Pixie altogether. UHG, you're right, this feels weird, Tiger complained. Can't use my quirk either, my body feels so stiff, feel like I'm made of rocks, Tiger stated. Again, 30 seconds passed and the anchor of void light vanished. Well, that was an experience, Pixie commented. I guess this is lethal if it hits someone, Izuku nodded, the hero's side. Yeah, just aim at the ground in front of a rushing mob, the sight will stop them and if they don't well, they will get a nasty surprise, she said. Not to mention against rampaging villains, you quite literally kill their momentum, she added with a smirk. There are flaws in it, Aizawa stated, making the hero team groan. But it is obvious that it can do what mine can't, weaken mutation-based quirks, he stated with a grimace which in itself gives you an incredible advantage, you still need to train it, also the one with the sword, the staff, the maul and the shield. Also the one with the small blades. You mean the dawn blade, the arc staff, the fiery maul, sentinel shield and wraith blades? Izuka wondered. Why they are named and your cork ain't? Ragdoll wondered out loud. Because Dash. Because he cares more about flashiness like a dumb bitch. Izuku actually blinked, looking rather shocked. Looking around the pussycats were as shocked as him, but for different reasons. Oh my god, I'm so sorry! Mandalay apologized as she rushed past Izuku. There he spotted why she had rushed past him. She was standing in front of a kid, about Eri's age and height. He was dressed casually for the forest, short and a white t-shirt. What drew more his attention was the red head with two horns in it. And the look of conflict in his eyes there was hate 
There was anger, but there was also doubt, yet the anger seemed to be more prevalent on his eyes. She should know, it looked like a small katsuki bakugu. A small bakugu that cursed. Ah, uh, Inko-san, what's a bitch? All color drained from his face, alongside his mother's and oddly enough tigers and Aizawa. Ah, uh, Inko began. Ah, uh, tiger supplied then looked to one another then at Aizawa. In unison they nodded. It's a bad word. They replied at the same time, not really wanting to explain to a four-year-old girl what a bad word was. Hopefully she would forget. Otherwise they would throw a zuku in her way, better for their sanity. As for the boy in question, I was going to say they were named already, so no worries about naming them and sitting two hours thinking about names. Izuka began. So, who's he? He asked, somewhat nervously. In his experience, kids that curse at such a young age have a ridiculous quirk, or something happened. Okay, this is my nephew Koda, Mandalay said, kneeling and placing a hand on the kid's shoulder. The kid looked conflicted like wanting to swat the hand away but also liking the touch. I am currently his legal guardian. Izuku actually blinked, looked at Koda, and somewhat shuddered. The kid looked like a bootleg Bakugu with the way he was glaring at him. Uh, did I do something wrong? Izuku ventured. Yeah, exist. Was Koda less than eloquent but blunt answer. Yeah, I'm a gonna murder you now. M.O.M. Izuku all but yelled, making the area shake with his voice. Now Aizawa actually had a pretty idea of why Izuka kept just to whispers. Mike would never be able to make the immediate area shake with a shout like that, and the kid wasn't even trying. Please, he's just him. Izuka tried to defend the kid whom he met for just a minute. He alluded you were a mistake, you are not. Inko defended, rather angry, making Pixie Bob to take a step back and to Tiger to position himself behind Inko just in case. Koda was about to say something, but before he could say anything he was staring at a pair of red eyes, way too close for comfort, and narrowed at him. Apologize, Ari simply said, a small glare on her face, her lips pursed. Apologize, she repeated, taking a step onward. Make me, was all Koda said, taking a step forward. Mandalay was already behind him, hands clasped on his shoulders. He wants to be a hero. Heroes are stupid, he replied, venom in his lips. Apologize, Ari repeated, bitch, she added, throwing the word she learned of him back at him. Koda blinked, so did Mandalay, then he pushed Ari away. Izuku was already moving onward, but it was too late when Ari retaliated. Bam! By clocking him in the jaw, Kota cried as his jaw stinged and Mandalay was already on his side turning him and checking his jaw. Eri cried as well, holding her hand in pain, rubbing her knuckles as she glared at Koda, who despite being checked by Mandalay was throwing a glare of his own. I'm so sorry. Izuku and Mandalay apologized at the same time, pushing both kids away. It was obvious they would not get much right now, so they decided to call it a day, which to Aizawa was nice, but really inconvenient. Considering they had a time limit they had to squeeze to its limit, but he was also glad that at least they now had more time to draw a training regime. One that would begin, once he figures why Izuku dragged him to the room and started to work on his console. Why you dragged me here? Aizawa asked. Yeah, and why you dragged me here too? Tiger wondered as well, then again considering that Eri was around as well might clue them to something. Well, since we cut the training expo short, Izuka began, flopping to the ground and taking a controller. I think it would be a good idea to let you see from what I draw from, so you can get an idea and start making plans for training. Izuka continued. Even ask me some things. What you see in-game doesn't reflect what I'll be doing afterwards. Izuka said, booting the console on, and after a while started to scroll on a list of games, a long one. You, got a lot of games. Aizawa replied honestly he saw them as a waste of time, time eaters. Eh, when you have a 50 terabyte console you can go a little, ham, Izuka stated. Then again every game here dates back before the age of quirks, in their unique way they are time capsules, while the ones that are based on the real world, Call of Duty, Tom Clancy, the hardest game I have ever played was Spec Ops, The Line. 
And no, it wasn't because it was hard, but because it was raw, it show you a face of war most AAA games never dared to, not even Call of Duty at its best. Izuka replied. Besides, since I was labeled quirkless, this was a way to escape. Izuka stated almost softly, missing Aizawa and Tiger's winces. It was no secret, quirkless tended to gravitate towards many manners of escapism, be it reading, writing, or video games. All three require no quirks to be good at, despite what others said, the best books currently on sale have been written by quirkless individuals. As for games, it was by far the favorite choice for them. To live off the fantasy of power in a world where you could make a difference, unlike in the real world where apparently not even an army can make a difference, the choice was obvious. There was no surprise many of these ended up as recluses that lived on their homes and works. No social life, just work, home, games, sleep, rinse and repeat. Honestly, it was a better choice, considering that they tended to have better odds at living to an old age compared to the rest of the corkless, whose leading cause of death was suicide. It brought a deeper level as of why Izuka treated things as it was now, why he acted the way he did, to him the games he played taught him more of the world than the world itself, even if it was a fake reality, they taught more about morality and the price of failure than the real world, at least to him. Okay. So quick rundown in this game, have you read the book Parasite Eve? Izuka asked. Tiger nodded, Aizawa kinda did, more like Murami did, and it kinda freaked him the hell out, for a woman who dresses as a dominatrix and he hopes not, has a sex dungeon somewhere, reading about a monster that can set people on fire by just a thought by manipulating their cells and wanted to create a perfect being and kill humanity dead. Was not his choice of reading before bed literature. He watches cat videos, and videos of people doing stupid shit, way funnier seeing the agony of others and cat paws. Okay, so the games are basically the spiritual sequel to the book. In the book, Eve loses thanks to overconfidence, hubris, and not checking if what she was getting was what she wanted, and science, Izuka reminded. The first game takes that premise and takes Eve, and roids her up. I mean she turns into a weird monster that shoots lasers and turn people into goop with a thought. She does what? Tiger wondered. That wasn't on the book. Exactly, the developers and writers took liberties with Eve on this one, as in adding a small army of mutated creatures, neomitochondria creatures, heavily mutated, example, New York rats, now they are the size of a Doberman, and their tails shoot fire. Tiger looked aghast at the very idea of fire tossing rats of the size of the Doberman. But then adds a counter, in this case, Aya, according to in-game lore, Aya is in fact a neomitochondria hunter, the predator of Eve's species, as Eve herself called NMC as the natural predators of humans, it all ties up to nature really not liking when someone messes up the balance and organ transplant, from there Aya gets her powers. Unlike Eve she doesn't turn into a monstrosity at least not in the second game, it's not night bulletproof and can be approached by normal humans, but has powers thanks to her overcharged mitochondria, the first game was the masterpiece, but the powers were lacking, offensively we had just about two, we depend on guns for the offensive. The second game not so much, we have guns but also new powers as many NMC now are naturally resistant to bullets, ergo shooting fireballs of your hands or vaporizing them by setting off mini-fusions. Izuka stated, Those powers will come in handy greatly. Once I got them, if I can, you remember the specific weakness of my quirk? Must have started its life in a video game. Parasite Eve stared as a book, Tiger stated. But Aya and the concept of her powers didn't. She can be considered an OC if you want to be a Puritan. I am aiming to exploit that particular weakness. If it works... Well, then I must start checking on another loopholes to exploit, or someone might be able to. Izuku added, Aizawa nodded at that. Despite the fact Izuku seemed to be immune to quirk-related suppressants didn't meant he was invincible. It was left unsaid, but Mandalay had broadcasted it to everyone. If Izuku gained such strengths, he must gain also their weaknesses. Now, Izuku said as the game booted, My quirk! It's rather weird when it handled the new powers I gain them, but they become broken, for a lack of better words. Broken, yeah, they worked alright before. 
Tiger muttered, crossing his arms and seating on the bed nearby. Ari, who was seated on the bed, slightly jumped by his bigger frame sitting nearby. Not in that way. Destiny 2 had a very specific way to handle supers. First off, you had to access a menu to switch off subclasses. Solar, Arc and Void. I can do that in an instant. Two seconds top when I'm accessing the Void. Second, my body's constantly supercharged with any kind of light I'm attuned to. Melee attacks a game have two mods. Charged and normal. Charged attacks have many effects, and unless you're using specific exotic armors or Monte Carlo, you have to wait until you can use it again. I can constantly use it no problem. Then there is the supers. In game there is a bar for it. When it's full you can use your super. It's the option when the rocket launcher fails. And most roaming supers are timed. You saw how many times I used mine, without time restrictions. Izuku explained as he began to navigate Parasite Eve 2 menu, loading its latest save file. That's what you meant by broken. Tiger muttered Izuka nodded. But you saw flaws in it as well? Again Izuka noted. Yep, all subclasses have several perks. Example the Sunbreaker can toss hammers that explode on impact. But you can modify them to actually have a cluster bomb effect. Or when you toss them and they explode they can generate what they call a sunspot. A focal point of energy that will burn anything caught in it. And add over shield on me when inside. Cast hammers faster. Or use melting point. Basically turning natural defenses to mush with a well-placed hit so the rest can DPS with impunity. Izuku explained, it took Tiger and Aizawa all they had to keep up with him on that explanation. So far I have only been able to unlock one perk, the landfall of the Storm Trance perk tree. Basically when I cast Storm Trance I will be able to cast a massive lightning bolt under me, causing massive area of effect damage where I'm at. Also I can control it. That means I can turn the perk on or off at my beck and call. Something you can't do in-game unless you switch to the other perk tree, which means I can unlock the perks associated with the skill and turn them on or off depending on the situation, which alone it's going to be a pain. This led me to focus on finding other sources of power-ups that might not be as deadly as the light. And use the light as last resort, or bow disposer. Izuku admitted as he finally loaded the save file and started to play. You got a plan and actual hindsight of your strengths as weaknesses. Aizawa began, seeing Izuku manipulate a blonde woman that moved with the speed of a snail, while running. Most students I have met only focus on their strengths. They obviously forget the weaknesses their quirks have, and falls to me or someone else to fix that, Aizawa stated. You usually just expel them, Tiger said with a grin seeing Izuku open a menu and start fiddling with the gear in it. Okay, what you're facing here? Two bosses, one after the other. Thankfully I have some recovery time from one fight to the other. First one, Brahman Massive, has a lot of health, mostly thanks to its limbs, can cast multitude of status effects if not careful, a tank, but a static one. The strategy here is using energy shot for gun buff damage and inferno to damage every limb. Take the arms first to stop it using its gas, then move behind. Take the tails, then move forward. Take the head, the chest open, reveals the core, shoot it when it's open. Use apobiosis to stagger it and make more time to damage. Repeat until it dies, if possible dismember fully. The last boss has less health when Brahman is completely butchered. Izuku explained, making Aizawa and Tiger blink. Second boss, Mitochondria Eve, Speedy. If I destroy all the body parts of Braham, I only have to deal with a 6000 HP boss, compared to the 13800 HP Braham. This fight should be easy. But if I don't, I have to deal with that initial health alongside 80% of each surviving body part of Braham added to her health pool. She's fast moving. Making the fight difficult, using apobiosis works the best as it stuns her and allows me to deal extra damage. Once she's half health, she goes crazy creates illusions and toss-seeking energy balls, still apobiosis is the best bet. Also the magnum with Medea rounds, poison rounds. Izuka said with a small smirk, Aizawa and Tiger blinked. Uh, what's apoapobiosis? Eri asked. Apobiosis, it's a medical term for death, or more precise, the death of a part of an organism, Tiger uttered. In game, describe it as that, it accelerates programmed cellular death, at level 3 it can stun multiple targets, 
great when surrounded and not able to reload. It does decent damage. I always start upgrading Apobiosis, then go for Life Drain, Combustion and Energy Shot. Keep myself balanced and capable of taking multiple opponents. I always leave Fire Spells last. They do damage alright. But compared to Plasma that works wonders on Mind Sucklers, not waste ammo and if lucky grounds them, the aim system in here is bad. Izuku admitted. I'm more worried what will happen when you get all this. Aizawa admitted. You're messing with your genes. Doesn't a quirk does the exact same thing? Izuka reposted. The ability to emit quirk cancelling radiation from one's eyes can be considered genetic alteration, nitroglycerin for sweat, telepathy, terakinesis. In a nutshell, quirks are basically watered-down versions of conduits, whereas a conduit would be all-powerful in a single element. Let it be electricity or actually paper manipulation. Quirks had multiple versatilities, but the core remains the same. Evolution through genetic manipulation. Let it be natural or artificial. No one did ever found out why quirks manifested this fast. Izuku admitted. Conduits? Aizawa asked, seeing the kid start a fight with what he could better describe as an oversized fetus of a monster without a face, roided up, and that laughed, laughed like damned villain on trigger. Yeah, tonight I'm listening to Mike and his show to not dream of this thing. Honestly said this was a horror show, but now they had a small reference window of what Izuku would be able to do, as he began his fight by covering his character in blue, white and red sparks. Another thing I'm planning to add conduits are a super-powered version of a quirk user, on a more specific term an elementalist, think of your basic pyrokinetic able quirk user, Endeavor and Bernan. A conduit with fire-based powers would make them kneel for one particular reason. A conduit can feed off their source of power, in this example. Fire, heal using fire, are naturally tougher, can fall of a building, land on their feet and walk away. Of course they can attack using all manners of fire-based attacks. But what makes them stronger is what it is called the karma system. Izuku explained, blowing one arm of Braham with his grenade launcher. I love games with moral choice in them. Fallout New Vegas it's played with that. Be good, bed bad, the choice it's yours. But Infamous takes it to a new level. Be good, it reflects on you and how you attack. Your attacks are weaker, but more focused. You look better. New attacks are opened and you look calmer. Do evil you attack harder. But your accuracy it's the equivalent of blind shooting with a shotgun. Also you look unstable, horrible. You get more powerful attacks more powerful collateral able attacks. Aizawa and Tiger actually looked rather shocked at that. And you want to add that? Tiger wondered out loud. I guess they add a lot of benefits, naturally tougher and able to heal by, absorbing the element they manipulate, but the downsides. He added with a frown. Yeah, I know, but honestly, I'm doing it because of how effective they are when they subdue targets. Izuka said, his eyes glued on the screen. The Braham now was lacking two arms, its tail and he was working on its head. With experience a conduit can use their powers to actually subdue and bind their targets down. Hell the one I'm aiming at has a very neat way to subdue and bind opponents in non-lethal ways, and with no collateral damage. Izuku explained, now the core of Braham was opened, a well-placed apobiosis and now he had time to unload. But you're not getting them now are you? Aizawa asked. In paper it sounded like a very effective power to get, way too effective, instant binding with your powers? Would save him the problems with his capture tape, or healing via absorption of the element you manipulate? Yes please, for underground heroes, that was a game breaker. No, as much as I want them. No, after these three, I will wait a month, try to think new things, get used to what I have before adding more. I still need to know how much I can get before I reach a limit, see my weaknesses, cover them, or make them visible, so visible that any might think them as strengths. Hiding in plain sight. Izuka said as Braham now died, letting out shrills of pain and it dissolved. Besides, these three cover something I don't have with the light, non-lethal options to fight, Izuka added. The light's strong, way too strong, I can vaporize someone with lighting. I can tone it down but it will take time until I have it down for non-lethal takedowns. Parasite energy it's my first solution and counter to anything that might come my way.
Izuka said, managing the menus and the items he had spent in the fight and changing the guns he had before for something else. You said it yourself, you have enhanced strength, and grapples would help you greatly, Tiger stated. Yes, but how much enhanced strength is the question, how much can I lift? Punch? Grip? Especially when I add more strength enhancing powers, trust me the third one will enhance my strength, in its second form of course, Izuka said. Then there is Castlevania. Yeah, you are having doubts with that one, right? Aizawa wondered. Advice don't work or don't this will teach you. Have spares. Prepare for the unexpected. If it works, you'll have an important weapon in your arsenal. Aizawa stated. Honestly, he was waiting for power number two. It would make Izuku a really versatile hero in training. If it worked being the keyword. He didn't understood much of his explanation. He was already swimming neck high trying to understand the many scientific terms he used when he announced he was going to supercharge his cells and turn his mitochondria in a true powerhouse, instead of a meme. While one had science, spotty at best, backing him up in his explanation. The other one had esotericism and things that weren't logical by any stretch of the imagination. But his quirk already pushed beyond the point of logic, simply said, he had already accepted that despite his early misgivings, and so far the kid had shown that he wasn't adding powers just because they were flashy, no, they were flashy as a byproduct of their effectiveness, the Well of Dawn had proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. He felt invigorated by just standing inside it, far more than any coffee would be able to do, the kid didn't care if they were the flashiest power around, as long they functioned as he expected them to, the light was chosen by him because it covered many areas, from combat to support and defense. He chose the siren powers because they added a middle tier between effectiveness and dissuasion. No many villains would want to fight someone that can launch his arms like rockets and infuse with alien energies and hit hard enough to flip a truck, or blow a living being to a grease spot on a wall. They would have to work on that last one, to tone it down, the kid had good ideas, they just needed polishing. As he watched the kid wail on the last boss of the game, and shoot it with impunity, his thoughts turned to the training ahead, they would have to prepare a schedule, not just quirk training, he was already smart enough to train his quirk in ways many didn't dare, but more like physical, the kid is a noodle, despite his light enhanced strength. He would need to increase his stamina, his endurance, his very body, no hero is in fact out of shape, not even fat gum. Many tended to insult him for having a quirk that made him fat, that many same number tended to regret their life choices later. Durara loved the underworld. It was simple fact of life, dark calls dark, and in a shiny world full of heroes, the underworld was the ideal place for those who shy of the light or are outright repulsed by it. He hates the society that was built, even before heroes, it was a plastic society that simply existed to shine because it was made to shine, never to do so because it could do by its own accomplishments. Quirks, in his opinion, made it worse, that was why he aimed with the troop to create a perfect society, free of quirks and pretenses, where the work made would make society shine its brightest. But before that could happen, they had to burn the current one, destroy its foundations, to build upon it a better society, a greater one upon the bones of an older, flawed one. That's why he is here now, to recruit the dark, so when they find the light they can snuff it out. You drive a hard bargain. The mist of a man, dressed so sharply that made him felt underdressed, stated with a small echo in his voice, maybe the metal bracer on his neck also helped to that echo. Do I? I offer up the chance, the opportunity to start your crusade against the very heart of society, and you consider it a hard bargain? I would be insulted, but considering your nature of being, Durara stated, taking a sip from the whiskey glass he had been served by the well-dressed mist of a man. Most men would consider their words carefully. A voice from a nearby TV set made Durara roll his eyes. Okay, I tried to be nice and diplomatic, Durara said, turning to the TV set. I know who you are, how old you are, how powerful you are. Then you know the folly of strong-arming me or my associates. Also I have a satellite with orbital capabilities aimed straight at us, I can make it fire, 
and the ensuing explosion will erase all the Kamino Ward, your Noma storage facility, you, your apprentice and anyone else. I don't give a fuck about collateral. The payload is radioactive. Even if you warp away you will be poisoned, and as I recall, you don't do radiation well, especially after Ryumiteria. Durara snapped. You are the big mean here, I get that. But honestly, you legend is hyped up, you die as everyone else in this damn world. Quirk or no quirk, you bleed, that means you will die. I can make sure you die sooner. Durara snapped. Besides, I have little to nothing to lose. Someone will replace me, someone worse, someone that will find something of value to you and make you hear it scream in agony as you hold your guts in your hands, so cooperate, or I'll fuck you up. There was silence, the mist man remained silent, so did the silver-haired teen that had hands attached to his suit and was glaring at Durara, just looking for an opportunity to attack, an excuse, an order. None came, just a soft chuckle from the TV set. Oich, it's been a while since I have been, told, the man in the TV set stated. So, you want our help to kill a family? How quant, I have slaughter many. But an entire family no, what makes them so special and out of the reach of the troop? They are not out of our reach, they are just delaying the inevitable. But their continued existence is a problem. We are not going to do things half measure. If we have to nuke the place, we will. Durara stated. Then why haven't you? Lacking the kill streak? The teen with silver hair taunted. Sounds to me you noobs got stomped by a pro and now you're crying to your mamas. He added with a spiteful chuckle. Maybe so, but when all is said and done, the dead are the losers, and the living are the winners. They will be dead, so they lose. It's just a matter of time, but they're this thing. Durara said. Their existence will expose every single operation in Mizurifu. I know you don't want that. How can they do that? By sinking every single person in that coliseum. Their words would send every captured person there into a frenzy. They would start selling each other for protection and reductions of penalties. I know you have connections with several of those people. All it would take for the house of cards to come down would be the testimony of a housewife that doesn't know the true life of her husband, a ghost of a brat that didn't exist until two days ago, an heir to a dead empire and a boy that is your exact counterpart. Durara taunted, and you know that can happen, you won't just allow it. Your pride won't allow it. Durara added, Because deep down, you're afraid of the outcome you didn't plan, all for one. The new named man on the TV set remained silent, then he took a breath from his mouth and let it out. You are a conniving, spiteful viper, aren't you? I am what society wants me to be. I am quirkless, so I am worthless, so I always, always will go for the neck, because I am worthless, and therefore uncivilized. Durara stated with a smirk. Good, all for one replied with a small grin. It's been a while since I have the pleasure to work with someone with some nerve. He added, Nevertheless, you are right, oh so right, that aside, our goals align, if slightly, I have prepared for the eventuality of being found out, this early? No, but eventually, so with that in mind, Kuro Jairi? Yes, Sensei? The missed man, now named Kuro Jairi, bowed. Tell the doctor to prepare a couple gnomus. The one with the chainsaw arms and what was the other one he was working on? The DPS one sensei fires needles from its mouth and his hands have bone protrusions that hammer with cruelty and laced with poison. The silver-haired teen replied. Oh yes, that one. Thank you, Torumakuin. All for one stated, and the teen Toruma seemed to puff with pride. Of course I will send Torumakuin. I think this will be the perfect opportunity to prepare him. Let him have some experience on the field. Do as you wish when the time comes, Durara said, placing a pager on a nearby table. We'll send the call and a set of coordinates. Our associates will be waiting. I hope your friend here isn't opposed of transporting more people. He lives for it. Good, Durara said, finishing his drink and then placing a bill of money on the counter. The whiskey was good, better than my father's stock. I take pride on having only the best, Kuro Jairi stated. Durara hummed as he walked away, reaching for the door, then stopped. You know, he began. In the end, we will have to kill you. You directly oppose our plans. I hope you are not opposed of having your corpse cut into fine slices and put on glass for research. 
Boy, better men have tried. Just because your organization it's big doesn't mean is invincible. But yes, we will face each other. I hope you're not mad when I flay you alive. It's been a while since I have the motivation to do so. Durara remained silent, but the smirk on his lips said many things. You will be disappointed, I'm not a screamed. And with that he left the bar. Prick, Toruma stated, looking at the TV set once all for one chuckled. That boy, I'm going to enjoy making him scream. You need better hobby sensei, Toruma muttered. And you need a day in the sun and some chapstick but I'm not bitching you about it. I need to know. Inko wondered, seated on a sofa across Mandalay, the heroine slowly removing her paw-themed gloves and placing them on a chair nearby. I know children can be cruel, but that's because they don't know the meaning of the word tact. But your nephew, he went out of the line, Inko stated. Where are his parents? I want to talk to them, that kind of behavior. Well, I saw it on another kid and he grew to be rather brash. Inko supplied, knowing full well that Koda was pretty much on his way of becoming Katsuki Bakugi 2.0 with his attitude. You can't, was all Mandalay said with a sigh. Why not? Because they are dead, Ragdoll supplied from the side, her usual boundless energy gone in that moment. Our sister team, the Waterhose Duo, have you heard of them? Ragdoll asked. No, Inko confessed. Izuku might, I dare say there is not a hero he doesn't know about. Inko ventured, now regretting asking the question. Well, then that means he must know how they died. Mandalay muttered, her hands on her lap. It happened at least six months ago. She began. They were called for a small rescue mission, nothing big. The town they were headed had a history with accidents that time of the year. So they always answered, they were well no, loved too and the town was remote enough that they tended to visit when on leave. Sometimes we helped with those missions, not all as massive cataclysmic events that seemed to shatter the world in two. Inch Mandalay muttered. But that day was different. Ragdoll was under the influence of a nasty flu. Tiger had broken a leg during a previous mission and Pixie was on a seminar. As for me I had to attend a trial. One of the victims of a previous disaster was suing us for rescuing him saying he wanted to die, and we had no right to help him. So my sister and her husband went to that mission, alone. Mandalay confessed. That day, a monster that goes by muscular ventured into the town, seeking someone to fight to kill, Mandalay stated. He has a rap sheet of the likes it has been seen once every century. He has murdered heroes and civilians alike. That day he was ready to tear the town apart. But they didn't allow it and they paid with their lives for it. Mandalay sighed. This line of job, it is rare for a hero to retire from old actual old age. Most retire because of wounds, so you can imagine what's the second cause of retirement. Mandalay stated. They stopped the guy, he was captured, and they were celebrated. But that's the thing, they were celebrated. Do you know what that does to a kid of Koda's age? One day he had his parents happy. The next he is told they are dead but he should be happy because they lay their lives on the line of duty. That kind of thing messes people up. And well, Koda hates heroes now. Well hates everything related to it. Heroes, villains, quirks, just about everything. I had some very nasty discussions with him. It hurts. Mandalay stated, not noting that there was someone hiding, hearing everything. Look, I get he hates quirks and heroes and villains. But to go from that to say that my son was a mistake, that he's stupid, he's letting his anger do the talking, and if he doesn't control it then it's going to land him in troubles. Inko replied, on a corner Koda gritted his teeth. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it, he's conflicted. He wants to hate, but that means hating his parents, and if he does then that means he hates the people he loved the most, and it angers him because he can't understand it, he can't understand his feelings. He's too young to even be feeling that, to be thinking that. Inko confessed. On the corner, Koda closed his eyes. He didn't want to admit it, but the woman spoke truth. I'll let it slide, and I know you got your hands full. Here will work in us. Right now what Koda, your nephew needs it's his family. Try to spend time with him, not as Mandalay, but as his aunt. Try to separate those lives a little. It's gonna be hard, especially with us around. 
and Izuku it's pretty much gonna be using his quirk 24-7. And that's gonna trigger him. Also there's Eri, it's the second time I've seen her hit someone. Actually hit someone. I'll talk to her, see if I can see if she wants to forgive him. After all he offended someone that risked his life for her. Inko added. Kota had heard enough, he simply walked away. He didn't need to hear more of this. He was angry, so angry, he wanted to lash out. Then why the words of the green-haired woman hurt so much? Kota shook his head. She was right but she was wrong. He didn't knew it but the stubbornness of a kid his age made him conflicted. Kids dealt in absolutes. They had yet to see that the world was gray and the beginning of a life and the end of one were the only, true absolutes in the world. So that's how he found himself standing in front of a room. Door opened, seeing Tiger and that scraggly looking man that seemed to have never sleep in his life seated on a bed the girl that had punched him was also nearby but seated cross-legged at the side of the green boy who was playing a game there were monsters or a monster that looked like a kite decided to grow flesh and superpowers and a face and oh my god it does kamikaze runs he didn't realize until much later that he had seated at the other side of the green boy he had insulted and was playing a game he hasn't seen at all all he has on his console are really old games, he loves his parents, he would always, despite that voice that always says hate them, but when it came to entertainment they, were bad, like for real. He has played Super Mario Bros. at least 15 times, beat it up too, and Pac-Man, and Dig Dug, and Tetris, and that was about the only games he had, no kidding, really old games, for old games. So he was enthralled by what he was seeing. It was new, odd, exciting. What are you doing here? He heard the little girl ask. Looking him straight in the eyes and narrowing them at his presence, he paid her no mind, looking at the game instead. Airy, don't be rude, the boy with green hair replied. He can sit and watch, he said. Besides, I'm honest and done, he said. With some button presses, he let whatever cutscenes pass by, and the credits, letting the final score screen appear instead. A smile on his face said everything. It's happening, he said, taking a deep breath. As his body seemed to tense, the other adults on the room seemed to look at him, expecting for something. I expected colors, the long-haired one said with a bored tone. Yes, yeah, so did I when I first got one voluntary. The feeling is more internal, like ants crawling inside of you, but in a good way, like if they were making way for something else, otherwise it might hurt. I think my quirk modifies me to a molecular level, to adapt to what I got and changes me physically, at least internally. The tattoos I got all over my left side are the only outside evidence of what occurred the third time. Yeah, well they seem to be pulsing, Tiger stated. Koda actually blinked, he never noticed it. But the green-haired boy had blue, something on his neck, and it was pulsing, glowing on and off, in a relaxed pattern. Then the glow died out, settling itself on its natural blue color, but without glow. So, did it work? Tiger asked. His answer was for Izuku to raise a hand onward, clench it as a fist then bring it downward. All while blue dots of energy formed around him, then behind him an orb of green energy formed from the ground, and levitated to his height, gently floating and pulsing with energy. Yes, I can feel my cells too, like if I could individually manipulate them. Focus on what I want to work. It's overwhelming, the teen admitted. I got all the powers unlocked, but they feel weaker. Energy balls should be the size of a soccer ball, not a tennis ball. I guess my quirk materialized them. Everything else it's up to me. Training and getting them stronger, Izuku admitted, or modified it for real world use. I mean, what's harder to dodge, a tennis ball or a soccer ball? Tennis ball, Aizawa and Tiger replied at the same time. So, what now? Kota dared ask. He felt conflicted. He hated quirks. They took his parents. A voice screamed at him it wasn't the quirks, but a man who did it. But honestly, this quirk was awe-inspiring. By some reason, he didn't know why. He saw it in action before. Now, Izuka began. I get to name it, Izuka said, looking at the screen. After seeing what it has done, my quirk seems to adapt all the powers I get to real-world use. I mean they would act and react differently to reality. 
That's why the light feels so powerful. I tapped into fundamental forces no one has before. Ayan never mentions what it feels to have her powers and how they feel after use. Only that they feel warm. A side effect of cells working on tandem. But nothing else. Just that it makes her feel. A stranger in a normal world. But now. Izuka said, letting his hand onward. His hand immediately began to emit fire. A small ball of fire forming on his palm and licking at his skin as other flames formed on his fingers and fed it. After a while he clenched his hand and drowned the flame. So, what's its name? Aizawa asked. Izuka looked onward then looked at Aizawa. Hacks, a living cheat code. The jail cell usually drowned the sounds from outside. Not this time, considering there was a hole in the wall it might explain why. A step onward and he was out, hearing the sound of gunfire and scream, or everyone, both guards and prisoners. Looking around he saw a girl, a girl, wheeling that creepy motherfucker of moonfish, he never liked the guy, he eats his victims, there is a limit to things, and he likes to think that he would never cross the limit to cannibalism. A guard flew to a wall, and he followed his path of flight, letting out enough as the man's head caved on a wall. Too messy, five out of ten. He muttered as he walked towards the courtyard, there waited an helicopter, one where Moonfish was put in. Thankfully he had his muzzle on, he didn't want to cave his head mid-flight. Entering and seating, the man known as Muscular let out a grin, the girls that had started this prison break and slaughter, just to get him and Moonfish out, the messiest prison break no, people would be talking about it, he would be hunted by it. Another excuse for a fight. And that's a wrap, my incredible gaming heroes. Can you believe we've reached the end of our epic journey? What an unforgettable ride it has been. I hope you enjoyed every single moment as much as I did. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and stay connected for future adventures. But before we go, I want to express my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us on this extraordinary quest. Your support, comments, and enthusiasm have made this journey truly memorable. Remember, heroes are born from the love and passion of their fans, and you are the true heroes of this story. So keep gaming, keep dreaming, and never stop believing in the power of your own pixels. This is Kronos, signing off with a heartfelt thank you until our paths cross again in the realms of gaming greatness. Stay heroic, my friends.